So welcome everyone to the 2024 Israel Dev tutorial. And I'd like to introduce all the tutorial organizers. So you can you you know who to back during the tutorials. Uh, my name is Jill and uh, No, you can wait, and Mark, Wing, and Chris. So you probably already have a lot of interaction with us. And uh, okay, let's get started. <laughs> Um, yes, okay, as you all know, this is our first ESRSM in-person tutorial, and uh, this event is sponsored by the DOE VR. So we are very lucky to have this event host at this beautiful location of the Bay Area. And so hopefully you already get a chance to uh, look at, take a look at the Berkeley downtown, the campus and the hillside of the uh, city. And uh, I tried to get some nice visuals, but I, later I realized that the view from the window is actually the most incredible. <laughs> and I want to acknowledge the NERSC to uh, allow us to use their facility and uh, especially the world-class supercomputer. And I also want to uh, thank the amazing team, Celeste and Helen, and their team to help us all along. So a little bit more about the agenda. So we have four days in total. Um, in the AM, we'll have all the lectures. For the day one and the day two, we will have the more basic coupled and component lectures, including the introduction to ESRSM, the coupled system overview, the atmospheric modeling for day one, and day two, we will cover ocean and sea ice modeling, and then land and river modeling. Day three and day four is a little bit more forward looking. We will show our unique features, including a hierarchical of modeling configuration, including single column model, regional refined model, the multi scale modeling framework, and then the screen, the cloud resolving configuration. We will start our human earth system session day three. In the day four, we will complete the human earth system modeling session and have a series of science and technology highlights. And then we will walk through the test and the code review process uh, for contributing new features to ESRSM. And uh, for the afternoon sessions, we will have practicums for running ESRSM and the practice on post-processing. Every day you have the chance to run ESRSM and do some post-processing exercise. And on Friday afternoon, we will have component specific breakout and uh, ESRSM future plan session. And the depart departure will be before around 4 p.m. Then Wednesday and Tuesday, we'll have two guided tools to NERSC. We will have everyone to sign up if you are interested. And coffee refreshments are available every a.m. p.m. and we have lunch provided. And the first day tonight, we will have a dinner at Triple Rack, which is provided. So all the resources and the logistics for the tutorial material is in this main web page we already shared, including the agenda, pre-tutorial material, nurse quick reference, and other meeting logistics. So the project put a lot of efforts to put together this tutorial. So we have some expectations as the tutorial goes. So firstly, we want to everyone to gain some fundamental knowledge on our system simulation and understanding the model components of ESRSM and what makes the model unique. Uh, secondly, we want everyone to have hands-on experience running ESRSM, modifying the components and analyzing the model output. And we want everyone to learn best practice for utilizing the model and potentially uh, to contribute to the development of the whole project. And uh, lastly, we want you to know where to find resources, the documentation and the POCs if you want to start some collaboration. <laughs> Code of conduct, it's pretty standard. So we hope our meeting to be welcoming, respectful, inclusive, and collaborative. Also, please do abide by NERSC's code of conduct and follow the appropriate use of NERSC resource. Some 
uh, accepted behavior is linked here, and we don't need to do a tutorial on that. But if you do see any conduct or behavior that you are not comfortable with, please report to our meeting organizers so we can figure it out. So, and this is uh, our day one schedule. Um, so, and I do want to remind everyone to make sure you complete the checklist before the PM practicum session. So including logging to Prometer to use, to be able to use Git on Prometer and uh, clone the Israel model code into your local directory. And also have a review of the NERSC Jupyter Hub documentation uh, so that we can have a smooth start for your PM practicum. And uh, make sure to ask for assistance during breaks or, and don't be shy on Slack. We will be monitoring the chat. Um, yeah, I think I covered pretty much everything. Let's start our first presentation, which will be given by our lead PI, um, Dr. Dave Bader. Dave, the floor is all yours. Hi, first of all, I want to uh, Thank Jill and Noel and the rest of the organizing committee, William, Chris, who else? Mark, Mark on there. Um, a lot of work went into this uh, week for you folks. So um, we appreciate that. I appreciate Jennifer and Noel uh, arranging for Berkeley to host this for us. So thank you for that and for the Berkeley people to, to put it on. It's uh, First time we've done one of these, and we hope it's successful. Um, and from that, I'll just start. But I do appreciate all the hard work that, that's gone into this. Many months of work went into putting this together. So, so the E3SM project is about to celebrate its 10th anniversary. So we've been around a while. Um, this is kind of our elevator pitch. Um, we did not start this modeling project to produce another model for international assessments. Um, there are a couple big drivers for it. One, climate, the climate change reality and the fact that there was limited tools for uh, adaptation predictions, impacts work, mitigation options. So those all fit into the Department of Energy's mission. The Department of Energy needed a tool at its disposal, at its laboratories, where it could execute um, its mission in light of climate change. Second is the advent of the Exascale roadmap uh, by the DOE Leadership Computing Facilities and the comparable facilities at the National Nuclear Security Agency laboratories. The Department of Energy has always been a leader in computing technology at the high end. Uh, we're the risk taker for the rest of the simulation community, not just for climate, but obviously many other applications, materials, fusion energy, um, cosmology, you name it, uh, multiple applications and bringing a very you know new piece of hardware without a robust software stack into production work for applications is part of what the laboratory system does, including the folks here at NERC. So, you know, that comes down to it's a DOE model, right? It's not a community model, it's a DOE model. And it's for the DOE mission, not for everything, right? That's not why we started. We didn't, there's lots of models that do lots of different things. We don't need to do what they were doing. We need to focus on the DOE mission for this. And that's beyond the Office of Science mission. We view that as a cross DOE. And uh, we needed to adapt it to work on DOE computing systems. So um, as we've evolved as a project over the last 10 years, an ecosystem has been built around us. And there's many projects supported by the Office of Science. And now we're seeing more and more projects supported by the Applied Energy Offices that are making use of E3SM as a tool for their work. There's been uh, announcements of opportunity out. Uh, many people from both this laboratory and others have 
uh, competed, actually some of our team members competed against each other for that work, which is fine, right? This is how we want to transfer the knowledge and capabilities of the, of the model into the broader DOE mission. So it makes for some confusion, everything related to the model is not the model project. So I'm here talking about the model project. The model, because we've been successful in uh, expanding to the DOE system, DOE mission is being picked up and used by, by many other projects in both the Office of Science and outside the Office of Science. So when we started this, this is, believe it or not, very close to our original roadmap. And we've, we've stuck to it. The dates have slipped, but the paradigm hasn't. The idea was we would um, develop a model to be ready for the next generation of computers when it appeared. And we had the exascale roadmap already. We'd also adopt the paradigm that many numerical weather prediction centers use, which is a production model, model you're testing, and then a model you're developing. And then you roll the bottom one off as it ages and move the stack down to start a new development process. Model development takes anywhere from five to 10 years, but we wanna release one every three years. So this enables us to do that paradigm. And, and if you're familiar with some of the other modeling groups, what they try to do is get everything done because we're going to have a big release. So our attitude is, if it doesn't make this model, it'll make the next one. Right? So there's always another opportunity. We try to stay on the schedule. Although we haven't been able to just because realities. Um, you know, this is this was what we wanted to do. So, you know, we have major simulations, which we talk about in scientific uh, simulation campaigns focused on our science questions. We have versions of the model which are designed to meet the needs of these campaigns. And we focus on the coupled system, not on individual components. We still develop the model by components, but we're top down and we look at the fully coupled system. And I've had many conversations with many of the group leaders with the different components. If your new addition doesn't help the coupled system get better, I don't want it in the model, right? We're not trying to make the best components in the world, we're trying to make the best coupled system in the world. So here's the timeline, I kind of um, went through that. Um, let me skip that, that benefit of time. So our development priorities are driven by what we have science drivers. These are not everything the model is used for, but they um, provide a focus for our development for the coupled system in these three areas. And if we develop a model focused on these three science drivers, it will be useful for many things. But this provides a focus and sets priorities for how we develop the model instead of somebody just saying, I want to put my feature in the model, write one little paper, and then I'm going to disappear right, and leaving the project with something to support that we don't understand. So we set our priorities by whether they serve the science drivers as defined in simulation campaigns in our proposal to answer specific questions. So this is the, this is the paradigm that we used to prioritize our development. And you'll see, I'm not going to go through these, you'll see examples of them this week. I've seen this, the schedule of speakers, which is kind of giving you an idea on our, our philosophy. So because of that, I don't, I'm not a big fan of work charts, but I think the flow of this is important. So the requirements flow down from the science simulation campaigns to the development groups, who then return the capabilities back for the simulation campaigns. And then we have integration steps, very important. The coupled system, this, this is the one that drives everything together scientifically. They have an infrastructure, performance, and data that keeps all the computational and data aspects of the model together. Yes? Sorry, this is a silly question. What exactly is a science simulation campaign? It is a, so, oops. So for each of these <laughs> science drivers, for each of these science drivers, for each campaign, we develop science questions. Like, 
um, what will be changes with the North American water cycle, for instance. Right, so those questions then lead to a series of simulation experiments and design of those experiments to answer those specific questions. So these questions are all related to these drivers and the, they become more complicated and more difficult as time goes on as the model, as we get some answers and we move to the next stage. So the simulation campaigns are basically focused sets of simulations to answer specific questions we've raised in each of these science driver areas. That make sense? Yeah, thank you. Well, we, we covered that. So one of the things that was clear for many of these things, high resolution is something that's needed, um, particularly by the water cycle and sea level rise areas. We put a lot of work into developing both global high resolution and regionally refined resolution and making that part of our production system. Many models have regionally refined capabilities, but we focused on a couple of things. One, to make it in all the components, right? So we have regional refinement in all the components and the simulations are designed between those coupled regionally refined grids and multiple components, right? So that's particularly important for things uh, for water cycle in North America, for instance. So we have some standard grids. We have a North American regional refined grid, which is at 25 kilometers. Um, there's a, uh, for the Antarctic uh, ice problem, there's a regional refined grid around the, so, and then we have the, and then there's a Southern Ocean regional refined mesh too, which is, the grid spacing is denoted by the colors. You don't know the details, but so we've defined, we've made regional refinement a big part of what we do. This is a compromise of where we can use the computing to get um, regional resolution and even local resolution and not have to do it everywhere except where we want to focus it. So this has been a big part of how the science has driven our development priorities and things like the grid. Another big part, um, human or system feedbacks, we're coupling, I'm not, <laughs> the group that's doing this is coupling to the GKA model, the global change assessment model, um, which is, help me out, where's Jennifer? Did she leave? Anybody from the HES group here? You can't call them integrated assessment models anymore. They're called something else, multi-sector dynamics, I think, models. Um, Anyway, we're, we're, this is actually explicitly coupling instead of getting scenarios. This is very experimental. Scenarios designed. Now, GCAM has been used to develop some of the SSP scenarios for IPCC, right? But you want, now we can couple these to see if those assumptions are correct and feed into that. So this is another part of how we focus on the energy mission by coupling to this model. So the DOE... Uh, computing landscape. You don't need to look at all this. It's just the top 500, but the first two are the LCFs. This is Frontier. This is Aurora. Um, and you can go down and find more. But the focus is that DOE is a technology agency, and we're supposed to make use of that technology to advance DOE mission. So that's a big part of this. Department of uh, Office of Science Machines, numbers one, two, seven, and 12, top 500. Most of the power comes from GPUs, and this was a disruptive architectural change that happened with the an exascale, which was not prepared by most standard applications models. So our challenge was, how do we use that new technology? How to uh, meet our mission? So, Mission was to run efficiently on GPUs, right? So how do we do that? Well, we had to actually change the programming model and what we and, and the way we went about it. So all of our new code or all of our model will be written in C templated C. So we can make uh, more efficient and better use of um, the libraries that access the GPU. 
All right, so we have these hybrid CPU GPU systems. We need a model that can run on both. This template of C++ approach allows you to do that through the class system in an object-oriented language. We are the only C++ model of the world, I think. So um, some other ones are doing CUDA, Fortran, some other things, but this makes it performance portable. So they write the templates that are machine specific, but the rest of the model can be ported between machines. We're gonna get a big test on that when we take our frontier code and move it to Aurora. So that's, that's how that's gonna work out. So we'll see if the practice follows the theory when we get ready to do that. Um, we focused on high resolution to make use of this capability. Um, so here's some just benchmarks of, uh, this is a screen model. You'll hear about that from Peter. Um, <clears throat> it's almost six times faster accessing the GPUs and three and a half times faster per watt. Um, energy uh, benchmarks are now seen as, as important as throughput benchmarks for machines. You see all these things about the amount of power going into data centers and being, you know, in the thousands of megawatt range. So here's what we try, the way we do this and the way to go about programming. We've tried four transfer directives, it makes for horrible coding, and it didn't work real well, right? Um, went with a template of C++, We've now decided not to use Yakult and just use the Cocos library, which is developed for multiple applications, primarily based at, developed by Sandia, but it has a much larger community now for its library. And then domain-specific languages, there's been many groups who are proposing that. I think they'll probably be one of the major centers, possibly <laughs> in Europe, um, or maybe even someplace like GFDL will come out with a, ESL for climate modeling, it'll be interesting to compare what to do. But in all these cases, we require a, a change in our programming model. And that's disrupted to a community that's basically been using the same programming model since 1995 when distributed memory supercomputers came out. So, uh, we have some GPU, we have global cloud resolving simulations, and these are actual reproductions of, uh, you know, specific events. And you can see the comparisons between the satellite model and the, sat the satellite data and the screen model. And it turns out, you know, we do a pretty good job. This in the PowerPoint version is actually an animation of an atmospheric river coming in on the west coast of the U.S., but I always go to meetings with PDFs, so I don't run into trouble with displays, even though I lose animation capabilities. So uh, cloud resolving atmosphere, um, V4 atmosphere. This will be a multiple resolution model. So it won't just be for the high resolution. This will be the workhorse atmospheric GCM and E3SN. It'll be entirely C++ Cocos. It'll build off the, the screen die We'll add parameterizations, change the resolution, couple it to the rest of the system. So I think I'm doing it right here, right? Time wise. Yeah. So our work, many of you probably know, a couple of people, Noel was on this team, um, got the first Gordon Bell Prize in simulation. So pretty happy about that. Problem is, what do you do after that? How do you top that? I don't know, but it was a pretty big deal for us. <laughs> Chris is here too. Chris, huh? Chris, Chris is on there. Chris is on there? Yeah. Okay. So this is a team of, of climate scientists, numerical methods folks, computational experts. Um, it was a, it, interesting. It's, it's what this project's all about, is, is having this cross disciplinary team. So, where do we go from here? We've been in existence 10 years. That's old for a DOE project. For any of you who know 
been in DOE land and all of you are babies here. So <clears throat> I haven't been around to see the rise and fall of big projects in Office of Science world. But um, we're going to have to push past even Exascale. Machine learning is a big thing. You can have, we was at a meeting last week. We were talking about how machine learning goes into, into all of our climate models. It's a meeting of the climate modeling centers in the U.S. And, you know, this conversation today will be different in two weeks. Things are just moving so fast in this world. But the one thing we need to realize is machine learning, artificial intelligence is all based on data, right? It can't do a prediction of something that has not been observed or happened yet. So um, there's always going to be a place for a physical model. There'll be places for machine learning aspects in the model, parameterization, um, data compression, machine learning. But imagine we've replaced the entire CMIP archive with emulators. You don't need to go through all this data again. You just pull, oh, I want the E3S emulator, E3S emulator for the historical period. You pull it off, you run it for the period you want, and it'll give you the same information that you would have had from downloading, you know, petabyte of data. E3S and 4 be the center of, a, of an ecosystem, right, of digital twins. Digital twins is model and data fusion. We were not going to do all of that in this project, but our model will be the basis for the model component of that. And why? Getting back to DOE mission. Right, uh, actual projections of the human earth system evolution as it's relevant to DOE. So that's the end of my talk. I'm glad to take a couple questions before I turn over to Renata. Uh, no question. Okay. Yes. What's I'm new to the modeling world. What is the advantage of digital twins from your perspective? There are several advantages. Uh, first of all, there's no uniform definition of what a digital twin is, right? And there's been multiple conferences, including this ETH conference in Europe on digital twins and in other areas they have digital twins. One thing is um, models are imperfect. In real-time comparisons with data, we have the ARM facility, we have things like Engie. You get that analysis of what's going on, and you can create ways to look at your errors in your model and ways to figure out what's going on. That's just one I can think of, right? Or it's part of an assimilation system, right? You could bring that in in much better real-time instead of processing the assimilation field and then bringing it into your model. I think it's going to transform the way we do many things and, and what we do with, with predictions. So, thank you. Any other question? Oh. Question about physics versus like biogeochemistry, et cetera. So, oh, what? so physics versus biogeochemistry and the other non physical components of the model. Right. How's the partitioning of that being done at the moment? And does it change through the phases? Is it something that get the physics right and then expand to other components that are non physics? Um, okay, yes and no. The models are developed. I really wish Jennifer would. <laughs> um, Yin, Chris, right? They take the pieces and put together the physical model. You can't get the, B the BGC right until you get the physical part right. Mainly, biggest problem for you, the ocean transport. If the ocean transport wrong, all the ocean BGC is wrong, which has been a big issue for us, right? So that's that's one of the, one of the major issues, right? You can't. You can't have a good BGC model without a good physical climate system that drives it, mainly because of the transport and other aspects of it. So, but well, the way we actually answer your question, how we do it, BGC group's working. We release, uh, we, we don't release because it's open development. We tag the model, like 3.0 will be mostly a physical climate model. 3.1 will be the BGC version of that model for the HES science question. Any other questions? All right. Yes. Yeah, I'm just wondering about the model uh, documentation. So um, sometimes we still can use the kind of land model uh, documentation from a COM model, something like that. I don't know if the ESRSM will have a kind of better 
uh, kind of documentation development. You'll hear about that this week, I promise. Okay. <laughs> Renata and I spent an hour talking about documentation. Thank you. <laughs> Renata can cover some of the first. <laughs> Next up, uh, Renata, uh, Dr. Renata McCoy. Uh, she's the ETRASM Chief Operating Officer and the Project Engineer. She will share the resources and policies of ETRASM as an open development project. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are very uh, happy to have this first uh, ever tutorials, and uh, we hope that you will enjoy it and, and uh, learn a lot. Um, I'll talk about the IFRSM as an open source, uh, open science development project. I'll point you, point you to a lot of resources and, and talk about policies. Uh, so uh, our uh, developmental code is open to everyone as of the first release of a, of a model, uh, which happened in April 2018. Um, and you have a, a link to that. Of course, you probably all know about that. Also, all the tools, every so all the software that we are developing is also open source. And uh, the documentation on tools, you can see uh, uh, those two uh, links here. Uh, we have this now centralized documentation space. Someone was asking about documentation. <laughs> we are already working on it hard. And the, the best place uh, to check is uh, docs.ifresm.org has a lot of documentation now that we pulled for this tutorial here. And we will be working more to, to cover more things for uh, but also you have some other resources on the 3 smorg which is our main um, uh, website. Uh, so for the data, uh, also uh, we are publishing all the data from major simulations. They are available to all. We publish them to the uh, Earth System Grid Federation, ESGF. Uh, as the default, uh, all the uh, files in the native format, uh, meaning unchanged output from the model, some climatologies and some time series are uh, published to the ESGF, to the IFRESM project on, e uh, on ESGF. And uh, some simulation uh, simulations follow the uh, very strict protocols of SIMIR 6. And for both simulations, we also uh, publish the data, subset of the data, to the SIMIR 6 project on ESGF. And you have a link here. Um, and uh, we are very lucky that the uh, NERSC is really good for us and, and, and let us uh, archive all the data. So all the output from, from all the simulations are actually also archived uh, to the tape, to the uh, NERSC HBSS. Uh, the data is published a few months after the simulations are completed uh, to allow the them to submit some overview papers on this development. Um, and here's a slide on how would you find the data, what is there, and so on. So the first uh, link uh, gives you uh, the uh, description of all the data that, that we have published. And uh, for the completeness, you have those two links to the search on ESGF for in the E3SM project space and CMIP6 project space. And I want to point you also to the uh, documentation on this uh, centralized uh, space, this docs.ifresent.org, uh, where version two data and up will be uh, documented. This is a very nice uh, new documentation that links uh, not all, only the uh, links to the ESGF, to the uh, E3SM project on ESGF, CME 6 project on, on ESGF, but also points you to the uh, path to the HPSS and also provides the uh, reproduction scripts for uh, every simulation. Um, as Dave was uh, talking about, the uh, simulations uh, campaign follow the science drivers, and uh, those science drivers are uh, water cycle change and impacts, uh, human error system feedbacks. We um, shorten it to HES and uh, for the phase, phase one and phase two of version one and version two of the model, it was called BGC was more uh, broader, uh, broadly uh, 
biogeochemical cycles. And the third one, formerly uh, cryosphere uh, science driver, now it's uh, more focused is polar processes, uh, sea level rise and coastal impacts. And where it is maybe important for you for how to find simulations is because that's how we refer to those simulations. So for example, for the V2 water cycle simulation campaign, you would find, uh, find it uh, as a name, if there is V2 water cycle. Um, we have a limited support for the code. Um, so the simulations that are part of this production simulations uh, are, uh, have a, a, go through a very strict evaluation and testing, testing and they are deemed scientifically uh, validated uh, concepts and configurations, and only those are being supported. And you have here the, the branch, the tag, DOE for those, and, and also what science uh, campaign was done with those. So when you are looking for the code and you want to develop something, uh, we do... Uh, 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 we uh, recommend that you will uh, grab the, date, the, the code from the maintenance branch, one of those branches. So you have the links to, to those here. And those branches are updated and uh, when they're back fixes, so the tag is a little bit different on those. Um, and uh, those uh, are guaranteed to run, run out of the box on all the DOE LC computers. Okay, for the... Uh, policies. Um, so we are open science development. And as such, we do ask everyone to please respect the interest rights to uh, to have a first publication on the new development. Um, so uh, this applies to this is the situation when you work with a new code version, or uh, when you use a new feature. So very often the new features are coming uh, in the code uh, turned off. So they're not necessarily exercising the newest uh, uh, version of a, of a uh, code, even if it has a, a publication. So please be aware of that. And and uh, everyone should have uh, some contact with a point of contact uh, uh, on the E3SM and, and they can check if the specific development has a paper or not. And please respect that uh, the right for the EGRSM to have this publication first. Uh, also, it uh, applies to the cases when you uh, run the latest model configuration of composites or, or analyze it when you analyze the latest data. Um, you can, uh, we are recommending that you submit the collaboration request, and I will talk about it in a moment. And also, you pointed to the uh, policies for the uh, project. Um, as I was trying to say, so you can have access to this early uh, data, early access to the data simulations and uh, some internal documentation because um, until we have this uh, first publication, we do not uh, release necessarily those, uh, some internal documentation on those new development. Um, and uh, the way to do that is to submit the collaboration request. And there's a simple uh, one or two pager kind of a, uh, document uh, that asks, uh, what do you need? Uh, what research are you planning to do? Who is your point of contact? And, um, and you, you need to agree to collaborate with, uh, with us. So fill in the form. There is a um, link to that and send it in an email to um, uh, um Now, there are special consideration man, maybe for the projects or, or people who want to develop something, some code for the EGRSM. Uh, so there's a lot of ecosystem projects. We call those projects, uh, ecosystem projects, the projects that are funded by the BER to develop something towards EGRSM. And uh, if you do so, please coordinate early with a point of contact from the IFRESM uh, so that you know what are the current and future code uh, plans and whatever our uh, interest and needs. Uh, we, we do require all the new features and all the code ranges uh, to have a code review. And this is pretty extensive. It is, uh, 
design document, verification, validation, performance testing, and there's a link to this uh, code review. Uh, we ask you to adhere to coding standards, pay attention to performance, and plan a lot of time for integration. It's always a problem with the integration. And uh, also make sure that there is a development uh, developer available uh, to work with us after the first integration happens because there's always, uh, nearly always, there are some, some issues down the road when we start exercising the whole couple system. Uh, and there is a disclaimer too, that uh, we do not promise that we will incorporate the code. So we have a limited resources. And so um, we cannot guarantee that uh, everything that uh, someone would like to uh, incorporate into the, our code base that it will be taken. Uh, okay, so the main uh, links to the documentation, our centralized now, Documentation space, this is docs.ephrasum.org, it's really easy to remember. Uh, we also have a lot of documentation still in the confluence. We are working hard to, to put it all in the centralized form, but there's probably always will be some information that will be in confluence, so there's a link to that. And then diagnostics and analysis is uh, um, provided here. And this, um, docs.ifresm.org, there's a uh, picture here, and uh, the arrows are pointing to the ifresm project uh, components um, documentation. The second arrow is for analysis, and the third arrow also, uh, note this is the user guide for step-by-step -step how to run the, um, the model. It's really nice and extensive documentation. Um, we do have tutorials. Uh, we will put both tutorials right now in this space as well. And of course, you know, the Confluence uh, space for the tutorials right now. Uh, we have webinars and presentations. We uh, we do uh, um, have both presentations and YouTube videos. Uh, and you have a link to that. And also please look at the uh, journal publications. We have a lot of publications that you might find interesting. Um, how to get help? Again, uh, ifresm.org and the resources, uh, there's a help and most of those uh, specific, specified here too. So uh, where would you ask a question about the model? Uh, go to GitHub discussion and, and uh, help issue there. Um, how to ask questions about the data or, or, or if you find a problem, uh, email the ifresm data support. Uh, there are some news uh, email lists, so please check those out. And uh, if you do want to contribute uh, to the code or you have a bug fix, uh, please check this uh, contributing uh, guidelines. And uh, lastly, about the ifresm communication, uh, the main website is ifresm.org. Please check it out. Uh, we also have a conference space for conferences and uh, and uh, present with presentations and and uh, sometimes videos, not always. Uh, we have the floating points newsletter, which is like a heartbeat of our projects, where everything that is going on on the projects, the latest news, research highlights, uh, project visions, roadmaps, and so on. Um, you can find there. So I. I uh, I recommend uh, subscribing to that. It's self subscribe so you can just email uh, listserv at listserv.lnl.gov with a body subscribe, ephraism-news, um, and you'll be subscribed. Mm -hmm. And we have a ephraism YouTube channel, which is listed. That's it. Thank you. And Thank you, Renata and Dave, come out to give this overview talk. So if you guys have any questions, you can feel free to ask when they're here. Okay, for this session, uh, Dr. Chris Golos will give an overview of the ESRSM couple system. Uh, Chris has been leading the coupled group.
uh, in Israel SM. And before his time with Israel SM, he has been lead leading the atmospheric de model development and a couple model developments in G GFDL. So let's welcome uh, Chris. All right, let's get started. Thank you all for coming. So I'll give you some overview of the couple of system in ESPSM. So this is basically what we are trying to simulate. We are trying to simulate all the water and energy cycle across all the components. So atmosphere, land, ocean, sea ice, river, and so forth. So there's a lot of processes in each component and all those components have to talk together, ex exchanging mostly heat and water. So this is how it's done in EPSM. Uh, at the center, you have the coupler. Currently, we're using the, a coupler called CPL7. And then around that, we have components. So we have the atmosphere, we have the land. Mozart is the river runoff scheme. MPAS, ocean, and sea ice. And then we have optional component, as Dave mentioned earlier, the GCAM for HES application, uh, MALI for land ice, and Wave Watch 3 for the wave model. So all those components talk together through the coupler that is essentially the centerpiece of ESVSM. So the coupler is responsible for communication of the data between the components. But that, because those components work on different grid, it does require <laughs> remapping between the grid. And this is one of the big functions of the coupler. It has to remap conservatively and accurately <laughs> between one grid to another. So one grid may say bonjour, and the other one may say ni hao. And they have to talk to each other somehow. And that's the magic of the coupler. All right. So. Now, with this, this was the base configuration with all the components, but we can do various mixture and match, mix and match of the components. And this is where I get so we have a, some obscure nomenclature, G, I, F, B cases. And then we also have uh, things called AMIP, POMIP, CMIP. So let me go through some of that briefly. So those letter acronyms essentially refer to what are the components that are active or what components are what we call data components. So for example, here we have G cases where we have an active ocean and an active sea ice and the atmosphere is what we call a data atmosphere. So it's, it's data that is being read from offline. And they all talk, talk again through the coupler. We also, you'll hear a lot about F cases as well, where we have, oops, we have an active atmosphere, active river runoff, active land, and then the ocean is prescribed. So we prescribed SST. We also prescribed sea ice extent, but we do have column physics in the sea ice. So this is what we often refer to F cases. Uh, we also have I cases, where we mostly focus on the land, driving the line model offline. And then we have what we call the fully coupled physical couple system, where we have the atmosphere, active ocean, river runoff, land, and sea ice. So this is the physical system. This is what the couple group is responsible for. And then you have those additional components can, that can be added like GCAM or Wave Watch or other components. Then the MIPS refer to the standard model intercomparison project and roughly they match like this. So the G case corresponds more or less to OMIP, F case to AMIP, Atmosphere Model inter Intercomparison Project, and then the B case corresponds to CMIP, Coupled Model Intercomparison. Dave showed that slide already, so I, I won't have to go into details into that, but the coupled group sits in the middle here. We are part of the integration process, and we, we work very closely to, with the component groups who, we develop specific components, as well as with the science group, we develop and execute the science simulation campaign. So the responsibility of the couple, couple group is to develop the physical couple model, uh, which includes atmosphere, land, river, ocean, and sea ice component. And as I mentioned, we work very closely with the components group 
to test and integrate all the new components and features that come in various versions. Uh, we do major releases of the physical couple model. So that is V1, V2, V3. As Dave mentioned, we try to do a new major release every three years, more or less. And we are now at the V3 release. For each release, there's multiple configuration depending on the grids that are available. So low resolution, high resolution, North American region refined meshes are some configuration that you will hear of. And then you can then take a component a model version configuration, and then for each one of them, we run a set of simulation campaign. Some of the simulation we use to benchmark the model are the standard CMIP, CMIP DAC simulations, such as PI control, historical, 1% CO2, and so forth. And then we're also re uh, responsible for writing overview manuscript that describe those main major releases. And then those model releases are then further developed by the science group for their respective science simulation campaigns. So HES may activate additional components and so would the, the photo group. So a lot of effort is integration of the couple system and that does require a lot of model tuning. So we work very closely and iteratively with the component. Uh, we have, there's tuning that happens on the ocean sea ice G case, there's tuning that happens with F cases, ME simulation, and there's also tuning that happens within the land. And then all those components get coupled together and we, we try test them all and then we iterate between couple configuration and component level uh, configuration as we developed a new version of the couple model. The overarching goal of the final couple model is that it should have a near zero long-term net top of the atmosphere energy flux. So basically the energy flux at the top of the atmosphere should be zero and it should be stable. Uh, there should be very little drift in the global mean surface air temperature when we run the PI control simulation. And then this, that surface mean global temperature should be reasonable. Everything above that is we try to improve as much as possible any many climate metrics and there's some some snapshot here of some climate metrics we look at. Uh, when we develop the model, we have so we have also learned from experience that we also need to run additional tests. Uh, we need to evaluate the climate sensitivity of the model. We need to evaluate the aerosol effective radiative forcing, and we have also in previous we have done a number of test historical simulation to make sure the model was behaving as expected. So now just a few slides, a brief retrospective of the different versions of the model that we have produced since uh, the ESVSM project started about 10 years ago. So this was ESVSM V1 released in uh, 2019. Uh, this was our first model release, so we're really happy to be able to just succeed in producing a global, a global model that was uh, credible. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the objective is to have a very stable um, control simulation. So this is what I called stable climate when boring is good. So you can see the top of the atmosphere flux is averages around close to 0 0.01 watts squared per meter. So very close to zero, very stable. You see there's no drift. Uh, the surface temperature has a little bit drift over the 500 years, but a lot less over the last 400 year of PI control. So again, very stable. And so is maximum and minimum sea ice extent in the Arctic and the Antarctic. So this is boring, but this is actually not that easy to achieve. So that's what we're trying to do whenever we release a model. Then we try to improve the climatology. And here's an example of this was the uh, error in the precipitation climatology that we had for V1, uh, typical biases that you would expect from a climate normal double ITCZ with excessive precipitation uh, north and south of the equator and also the dry Amazon. So those are biases we have been worked on and we have improved since V1. In V1, we also managed to get an ENSO for some of them. Some of those who were part of the development, we remember that time very well. It was very struggling for a long time. We had absolutely no ENSO 
and we had to postpone the release of the model until we could find it. And so when eventually we found it, it was hidden in the ocean. There was a bug and it, it came out. But those are the things that make climate model development interesting. So they, in addition to the low resolution version of V1 that I just mentioned, there was also a high resolution version. This is a 25 kilometer atmosphere, 18 to 6 kilometer ocean that had substantially improved climatology. It has a much stronger, much more realistic AMARC. And of course, you get a lot of nice improvement in regional precipitation, and you can then simulate strong tropical cyclones, something that you really cannot do with a, uh, at a one, using a one degree model. So there's lots of improvement if we go higher resolution, but obviously it becomes very expensive. So there's a limit on how many years we can simulate with such a configuration. Then moving on a couple of years later to V2, there were some nice improvements over V1. One of them was substantial reduction of the computational cost, uh, which you can see roughly from the size of those rectangles here. This was V1 and this is V2. And you see that the, the atmosphere, the size of the atmosphere rectangles shrank by almost uh, half to almost half of its original value. This was led, this was because of improvement in the dynamical core, as well as a change in the physics moving from to the physics, what we call the physics gradient. The precipitation, as I mentioned, this was this is the same figure as I showed earlier. This is the of daily precipitation in B2. So you see those are again the biases. So white is perfect or as good as it gets. And you can see that we have less uh, of the strong colors. We still have a double ITCZ, but it's substantially reduced compared to V1. And you can also see that the dry bias over Amazon is, is improving. Another thing that we managed to improve in V2 was to reduce the climate sensitivity. V1 was among one of the highest climate sensitivity model out there with a ECS of 5.3, which is not really credible based on um, various of line of evidence. And then in uh, V2, the ECS went down, the ECS went down to 1.4, which is still high, but it's, it's uh, much more within the realm of possibilities. The precipitation was not just the climatology, but also the diurnal cycle improved quite a bit. Yes. So when you're, so for precipitation, it's pretty clear you want to reduce biases. But for climate sensitivity, was that a purposeful tuning towards a more realistic value? Or was four degrees the emergent value? No, four degrees emerged. Emerged, yeah. We were hoping to get that. And there's a, Yi Ching has a nice paper. She goes over all the changes that were made and try to explain what happened. But no, we cannot, we're not to the point where we can say, I want an ECS of three, give me a model. Um, so for V2, this was the first fully coupled model where we had RM configuration in all the components. In the atmosphere, we have a visual refined mesh that goes from the low as 100 kilometer to a 25 kilometer over a large portion of North America. That gives you a much more realistic precipitation of the terrain over North America, and therefore also related a much more realistic representation of precipitation. Uh, wintertime precipitation gets much better due to the improved topography, but also summertime precipitation generally gets better. For example, the North American monsoon you see is much more realistic. And then there's a region where we find mesh over around North America with the ocean and sea ice going down to 14 kilometers. So very significant increase in resolution. And this model is, was actually affordable. So with this model, we're able to actually complete the entire set of CMIP deck simulation, which we believe that has never been done before using a regional refined model. So there's lots of data you can all get and analyze. Then there was a minor release of V2.1, which has some significant improvement in the ocean. And you can see the top plot shows the reduction in SST biases. It's probably here shows the reduction in SST biases, large reduction in SST bias over the North Atlantic, as well as corresponding to that as an increase in the strength of AMOC. And the mean climate is basically comparable or slightly better. So this is what we call a minor release. If there is a significant change, we will do a minor release of the model. 
Now, going on to some of the challenges in V1, V2, and V2.1, this is what we call a pothole problem. It is not unique to SVSM, but it's particularly bad in SVSM. And this is so the historical temperature record from Hadley CRU V5 here is shown is gray. And then ESVSM, both version 1 and 2, as well as 2.1, they were unable to really capture a realistic rendering of the historical temperature warming with a warming that is basically non-existent until the late 1990s, and then the warming is excessively large. So this, as you can see, it kind of looks like a pothole, so this is how it has become known in the community. So this was one of our major... Uh, one of the major problems we had in all the previous version of the model, and it does goes to the credibility of the model. So we put a very large emphasis on solving this problem for V3. So before we even did that, we did a lot of diagnostics. So let me go briefly over some of the diagnostic we did. And based on that diagnostic analysis, we found that it should be possible to achieve a much better agreement. This is the golden line here. And this, this is a hypothetical configuration where we reduce the aerosol forcing and we slightly reduce the sensitivity. So that analysis, even though it's not a model, gave us a direction where we should go in V3 in terms of achieving the goal that we wanted. So one thing what we did with the V2, and this was a suggestion of Dave Bader, is we ran some single forcing simulation. So you take the fully coupled model, but instead of varying all the forcing, you selectively vary only some of them. So you can only turn on greenhouse gases going from 1850 to 2015, or you can only turn on aerosol and aerosol precursor and so forth. So this is the beauty of doing model. You can just do stuff like that. You can just dream up experiment. So this is what it looks like. Um, the, oops. The red line shows what happens to the warming when you have only greenhouse gases. Um, the green line shows when you have every, all the uh, mostly natural forcing, so it's mostly flat with some variability. And the blue line shows you what happens when you have only aerosol forcing. So you have a very strong cooling from the aerosol forcing. And if you compare the blue and the red line, they basically match in magnitude for most of the 20th century, which is why the model fails to warm until the very end. So that this is how we concluded that we have to focus on aerosol forcing um, for the next version of the model. So let me show, see if I can show you, instead of going to this, let me see if I can show you how this looks interactively. All right, so this is interactively. So this is, um, ECS and V2, the gray line is the observation. And then if we plot the, the model, this is what we got. This is the ensemble mean of the model. So you can see the, the pothole and basically the lack of warming until near the end. Okay. So as I mentioned, this is um, okay. This is the greenhouse gas warming, as I mentioned. This is the it's not very responsive. Uh, the greenhouse gas cooling, and then if you and the the everything else basically mostly natural. So let's focus on just the red and the green, and you can sum them together. Okay, this is. You can sum them together. You sum the green, the red, and the blue together, and you get something that actually looks very much like the what we got in the historical simulation. So to a large degree, this is linear. So then you can actually play games, and you can reduce aerosol forcing, and you see what ha what happens. If you now this is greenhouse gas. So this is what happens if you reduce the warming for the greenhouse gas. You start to look more like just the aerosol only. That makes sense. And then if you re reduce the aerosol forcing, then you remove the cooling from the aerosol and you move the, the curve on. So you can play on with those two sliders and you can try to get a configuration that looks reasonably good. And uh, you'll get something maybe, uh, you reduce a little bit the sensitivity and then you reduce a little bit the aerosol and 
there you can start to look like uh, something much more visible. So maybe that's, you can see it's a very substantial reduction in the aerosol forcing. This is 70% and then a 15% reduction in the greenhouse gas warming here. You can also play it just for the fun of playing. You can also say there's no aerosol forcing. Just set it to zero, just for fun. And then you can see if you can adjust. And if you reduce the sensitivity, by around 40%, you can also get something that looks pretty good. So that helps us un helped us understand what we had to target for V3. So okay. Let me see if I can switch back to PowerPoint. Uh, no, still not full screen. Oh yeah, so I can skip this. I showed you how it works on the plot, it's more more fun and you can go to that interactive plot and you can play for yourself. This is how you actually do it uh, formally uh, rather than playing with sliders. So we don't need to go over that. So V3, a quick summary of what is going to be in V3. Uh, we have what we call a tri-grid configuration. So that means um, the land model and the river runoff model are going to be on their own grid, which is separate from all the other grids. So that's why the tri comes from. Uh, the reason for doing that is to e enable much more close coupling between the land and the river for like features such as water management, uh, irrigation, and so forth. Then the atmosphere is on its own. It's on its own grid and the ocean and sea ice are on their own grid. So you have three grids. That's what we call the tri grid. We also have a new uh, remapping algorithm to improve exchanges between those grids. The land is using a configuration that is much closer to the BGC mode uh, instead of the imposed vegetation from the satellite technology. And there's some other improvement regarding uh, sub grid topographic effect. The atmosphere has a lot of changes, and Shaocheng will talk about many of them later today. It's vastly improved tropical viability, aerosol chemistry. The ocean is using a brand new mesh, which is much higher resolution globally, around 30 kilometer, and also a more efficient time stepping and some improved prioritization that came in in the V2.1 release. And the sea ice has lots of improvement, many bug fixes, moving to the latest version of ice pack. Um, and significant uh, serious bug fixes were followed. So the ECS, this is not the final version of V3, but this is an alpha version of V3, and it looks like ECS is going to come down a little bit from where it was in uh, V2, going around 3.7 Kelvin, and so is TCR. TCR is also <laughs> going to be lower. Um, You can, and we, we are now getting much closer to the IPCC AR5 range. The TCR around 2.2 is within the range on the upper side, and then the ECS around 3.7 is, is well within the likely range. Okay, now the historical. So the time we may have finally made it. So you can see that, again, the same lines for V1 and V2 in red and blue. And then the first three ensemble member of V3 here, just almost hot after press, and you can see that they match the historical temperature much better. So we have something that is much more credible now. And this is especially the case if you look at the Northern Hemisphere, the smaller panel there on the right, where most of the aerosol forcing takes place. And you can see that we match the record much better than we did in uh, V1 and V2. So this is the big, one of the big achievements <coughs> in V3. Uh, now that improvement manifests itself also in the ocean. So you have lots of improvement because of that. And this shows a comparison of the upper ocean heat content. And in, uh, in V2.1 down there, it was completely unrealistic with the ocean losing heat essentially the, over the entire historical record. Uh, you can see the, the observation shows significant increase in heat in the ocean as the one would expect. And now we are able to capture that in V3. So that changes completely the ocean as well. Just a few ideas of some of the boxes that you have to go through. This is slash courtesy of Andrew Roberts. 
And if you look closely at those figures, you see that the B4 figure has those blue shading around the coastline. And Andrew Roberts discovered that and diagnosed the problem. So the issue is that in the atmosphere, we have to smooth the topography because otherwise the model is too noisy, too unstable. When you smooth the topography, you end up with land with ocean grid points that are not at zero altitude, which is kind of weird, but that's what happens. So the coasts, the ocean coasts are not at sea level. So what we are doing, we're passing the lowest model of grid point to the sea ice model, but that was not always at sea level. So we were passing an artificial pressure gradient to the ocean and the sea ice model. And that was causing all sorts of artifacts. And Andrew Roberts found that the problem, and now we are passing the sea level pressure, so the ocean and sea ice doesn't see that strange topography that we have to use in the atmosphere. And then the other figure, it may, it may be very, it took me a while myself to see it, but if you look at the figure before there, you see there's like two sets of lines. There's like a, what Andrew calls a ghost area, and he was able to find that, look, find a problem and then diagnose in the code there was some cut of values. So this is the kind of really tricky problem you have to try to find in a couple of models. All right, so a few words on performance. Every run that we do uh, is automatically added to what we call a performance analytics computational experiment. So the PACE database for short, and there's a link there on PACE. And what you have, there's a lot of information for every simulation that is entered on PACE, but one of them is that plot here that gives you a visual summary of the relative cost of each component. So on the horizontal axis, you have the number of processors that we use for that particular simulation. And then on the vertical axis is a, is a rendering of the time it took for the simulation to run. And then the area gives you how much where the component reside in terms of processor and then how much time they use. So you can see that the atmosphere is the, the biggest, uses the most time and the most processor. That's one thing you can see, but you can also see the sequencing of the components. So you can see that the sea ice and the land run in parallel on a different set of processor. The land is then followed by the river runoff model here. Those three components are then run sequentially with the atmosphere, and the ocean is run in parallel on a different set of processor at the same time, and then they all exchange information in the couple of phase of there. So it gives you both the sequencing of the components and the relative cost of the components. So it's really very useful information. You can also diagnose problems, lots of good stuff over there. Uh, now, on the, as Dave mentioned, for every model release, we do a simulation campaign. So this is the update on the Lua's V3 simulation campaign. We have completed the spin-up. We did 2,000 year. We have completed the PI control, three-member historical, and one-member AMIP. And then we are working on the about four time, on the CO2 simulation, both the 1% and about full-time CO2 simulation. And uh, unfortunately, we kind of hit a problem there. And this is what happens when you do couple modeling. You often have unexpected challenges, and those simulations are just crashing. And robustly crashing, they just refuse to go past the year 30 something. And we are actively working on resolving that. But it's, it, it can be quite frustrating. You think you're done, you think it's just a matter of running the simulation, and boom, the model doesn't want to. Yeah, so we're working on that. Hopefully, we'll have an answer for you in the in the near future. And then after that, we'll do a, a bunch of other simulation depending on the project need. Uh, so as I mentioned, there will be additional configuration. So for V3, we're going bold. We're going to have two additional configuration. We'll have a North American regional refined mesh configuration. This time, is the refinement is going to be in the atmosphere, going again as we, in V2 from 110 to 25 kilometer. But we decided that for this one, we'll keep the ocean and the sea ice at the 30 kilometer mesh, which is the same as the lowest mesh because it's already substantially higher resolution than it was in V2. And the land and the river are also refined to a quarter degree lat long grade. 
So the reason we decided to do that is because we are hoping that with this configuration, we'll be able to reuse the ocean and the sea ice state that we got from the spin-up in order to do visual refined configuration. We don't know yet if it's going to work, but if it, if it works, it's going to be really neat because instead of having to do the entire 2000 year spin-up simulation, we can branch from the low res simulation in terms of ocean, which is the one component and has a very long memory. We can reuse that ocean spin up and then do a, a regional refinement. So it would make the regional refine couple simulation much more affordable if it works. Then we also do decided that we'll revisit the high risk configuration that we did for V1 but not for V2. So this will be a 25 kilometer atmosphere and 18 to 6 kilometer ocean and sea ice and the land and river on the quarter degree light mark. And both configurations are being worked on as we speak. They are not ready yet, but hopefully will be ready later this year. <coughs> so my final slide. So as Dave mentioned, ECSM has long recognized uh, that the computer architecture is changing and moving towards GPU. That's where all the power is coming in the future. And therefore we must adapt. And that's actually one of the reasons the ECSM project exists. So Scream, also known as EMXX, is the first ECSM component that can fully utilize GPUs using a C++ and Cocos. For, right now it's used for global cloud resolving simulation at three kilometers. So we're going to move on the, in the V4 horizon, we're going to move the from using the old Fortran-based atmosphere to the new uh, C++ Cocos EMXX-based atmosphere. So that is going to be a major transition within the project. Uh, but as Dave has mentioned, it's not just going to be only cloud resolving. The ECSM project is committed to develop a lower resolution configuration that is capable of running thousands of years of simulation based on that new C++ Cocos atmosphere. The ocean is also under ongoing a similar transition uh, towards a new C++ code base Omega. So there's going to be lots of changes coming in the V4 uh, horizon time scale within the next few years. Lots of exciting changes. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. <laughs> We have questions from the room. I'm just curious, when you're transitioning to the new atmosphere and ocean model, are the numerics remaining the same? Or are you just are you just like directly porting from Fortran to C++? Or are you also simultaneously doing a uh, numerics upgrade? Um, the numerics are mostly the same. But they are, so the, in order to tackle the problem in a way that had a chance of succeeding, Peter Colwell decided on a very smart strategy, which was to split the, he, he decided it was too risky to do both a conversion to C++ and then try new numerics, completely new, phys new physics mostly. So they spent a lot of effort converting some of the existing uh, Fortran physics parameterization into C++. And they spend a lot of effort making sure that those, at least when they are used by themselves, would be would produce exactly the same answer. Now, the physics parameterization that they're using existed before, but that not necessarily the one that we're using in V3. For example, the, the microphysics is a new microphysics. It's similar to the one in V3. It's based on P3, but it's not exactly the same as in, in the V3 version. The boundary layer, scheme parameterization, they decided to go with something more affordable than, than club. So they went with something called shock, which is a similar principle as club, but substantially cheaper. So the parameterization are not the same. So it's going to be a mix at the end. <laughs> yeah, that was a really great talk, thank you. Um, as for the coupler, when you choose different components, um, so let's say you choose ocean and atmosphere, do you just leave the land constant or is it prescribed? What do you do with the components that are not active? If they are needed, then they are usually replaced by data. So you cannot do any combination, but like 
If it's only ocean and sea ice, you don't really need land except for runoff. So land doesn't exist, and the only thing that comes in is to eat the land. If we do atmosphere, then we cannot run the atmosphere without some kind of land because it's just not possible. So we all, those two always have to be together. So it, yeah. yeah, so our sort of related question, when you showed the fraction of the computation and land was such a smaller fraction, is that because physically there's not much going on in the land or is that because we put emphasis more on atmosphere and ocean? Um, one of the advantages that the land has that makes it cheaper is that it's just column based. So you don't have uh, horizontal advection or diffusion. I know it's all column based. We don't, so that makes it much cheaper. So it just pay the waste design is just naturally cheaper. Yeah. So on your last slide, you showed uh, the future version four for like atmosphere, ocean, and land. But I'm wondering, what's the plan for sea ice? What's the plan for sea ice? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody can speak more clearly about that than I would. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's still up here, but I think that uh, there's a, a plan to potentially put the die core in with Omega, the new ocean pump, and then still call it ice pack for the colonists. Which would make a lot of sense because it's really. The same physical system, just different phase. That's the middle weeds question. Sort of you related can? to the numeric the numerics. Like for a dynamical core, does switching to GPUs allow you to use other schemes? Like implicit schemes might be faster on a GPU where you can do matrix inversion faster. Are you thinking of updating the dynamical? or discretizations as well? I don't know. So why now it's the same, basically. I don't know if there's additional plans of modification. You can ask later today, there'll be more discussion on the atmosphere. Yeah, so uh, in, in one of your slices, you showed that the version three is um, have a better performance than version two and one. So is that, uh, so is that the C++ version you just talked no, about? No, no, all the version I showed, V1, V2, V3, they're all Fortran based here in the atmosphere. Okay. So the, the C++ development has been happening for the past several years in parallel, leading to that scream configuration that is a three kilometer global cloud resolving that won the gold, golden bell prize. And then in V4, we're going to put things together and we're going to create a lower resolution configuration of that component. Very, very quick question. Uh, in slide 25, uh, we see the simulations completed so far. I'm just curious, in CVIP 7, which version of e app will participate in? To be determined. Okay. <laughs> yes. um, so in slide 26, uh, you have a plan saying what you guys are going to do for the ARM. Um, so I saw the components for atmosphere, ocean, and land seem to be similar as scale. So if let's say if you plan to go higher resolution than 25 kilometer for the couples, do you have to have all three components similar? Um that really depends on what problem you're targeting. I mean, people do run. So like screen runs at three kilometer, it doesn't have an interactive ocean and it, it provides a lower resolution SSD boundary and you can do that. Obviously there's things you won't be able to resolve. You won't be able to resolve interaction between the ocean eddies and the atmosphere. So you don't necessarily have to, to refine all of them. It depends, but you have to be aware of the limitations. I'll just have a, a quick a philosophical question, which is when, when you go to the regionally refined meshes, you might be focused on Conus or Southern Ocean or, you know, some target area that you're actually trying to improve the simulation for. How does the evaluation work? Do you have global metrics that you're keeping track of as you're focusing on these high resolution meshes? 
Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Something I didn't mention. So we have in V2 North American RM, we have spent a lot of effort to make sure that the global climate was uh, of the same quality as the lowest version of the model. So that you can use that model fully coupled for long climate simulation. It's not just a model that only works inside of the region we find, and therefore you have sometimes some model configuration really are just they call them global, but they're really just regional model because they have to nudge outside. For those refinement, this is not the case. It's a global model. You get a good the climate you expect when you course on it to 100 kilometer, and then you'll get some benefits inside the refined region. Quick, quick question in this land: Do we have the plan for the ESRM high resolution ECU to simulations? High resolution ECU to simulations. High resolution CO2? Yes, yes. Like uh, wrap the water um, Probably. It, so we're currently building that high risk configuration, and what we do with it is going to depend how expensive it is and what are the computational resources that we have. If we have enough resources, we'll, we'll do as much simulation as we can afford. Uh, I wonder, could you comment more on the comparison of the computational performance of V2 versus V3? V2 versus V3, yes, I did not mention that. So there was a lot of addition in the atmosphere and that will be discussed later today. So uh, the model is more expensive than it was in V2. Yeah, <laughs> we cannot always make it cheaper. <laughs> Similarly, I was wondering if there was a loss of efficiency when you went from Fortran to C++. Uh, my understanding there is no loss of efficiency. But some there, leader... There's design decisions to make when you switch from CPU to GPU. And, and often if you optimize for GPU, the CPU may be the same speed or, or not as fast, but we're focused on GPU performance for these new codes. It's just one code base that you're able, able to swap back and forth, or that's, that's, that's correct. correct. And in Cocos, you can change which one you're running on. Yeah, <clears throat> one of the overriding principles because of DOE's philosophy of buying these machines is performance portability, which is one of the reasons we haven't gone to a DSL or specific language where. Uh, you know, a modeling center has a dedicated computer. Right? Performance so portability is a big part of it. Okay, we are at 10. Thank you, Chris, for a great talk and a very nice <laughs> <laughs> Chris will be around. So if you still want to discuss about things you are interested with uh, regarding to couple models, so feel free to join the lunch or uh, just catch Chris in the hall. Thank you for coming back in time. And uh, this session is for Israel FM Atmosphere Modeling. And firstly, we will have Xiao Chen to introduce this session. And then Paul Warwick will talk about the dy atmospheric dynamics. Xiao Chen then talk about atmospheric physics. So for our speakers, uh, Dr. Xiao Chen Xie has been leading the Israel FM Atmosphere Group since day one of the project. And uh, he is also leading the climate science section at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, Paul is also wearing two hats. He, he's been leading the climate resilience program at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And he is also a professor at University of uh, California, Davis. So Xia Chen, you can take away. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, in the next 90 minutes, uh, Paul and I will uh, give a very brief overview of the ESRSM atmospheric model. Uh, Paul will emphasize on the dynamic core, I will emphasize on model physics. So uh, before we start, I would like to first uh, give a very brief introduction on the atmospheric modeling and also a brief history of the uh, Israel Sam atmospheric model development. So let's first uh, review some uh, very basic 
about atmospheric modeling. Uh, atmospheric models are systems of consisting of uh, differential equations that govern the atmospheric motion and the evolution based on the basic laws of physics and the fluid motion. Uh, I believe you all learned this from your uh, colleague uh, courses. Uh, the set of equations also called as uh, perimeter equations is the base actually for both weather and the climate modeling. So those equations, including the momentum equations, the energy equations, the mass con uh, conservation and the moisture equations, and also ideal gas law. So uh, for atmospheric motion is contributed by both dynamics and uh, physics. Dynamics uh, is represented by those uh, advective terms and the physics uh, are represented by those flux terms like the ID flux of momentum and the, di the diabetic heating uh, due to radiative heating and the cooling sample heat flux, latent heating and cooling and also uh, diabetic moisting, uh, like condensation, the evaporation, and so on. So uh, an atmospheric model is actually a numerical prediction model to solve the primitive equations using the discrete form with numerical uh, methods since the Atlantic solution for those equations is impossible. Uh, as shown in this figure, uh, this image, Atmospheric models divide the Earth into a grid with vertical and horizontal intervals, which are uh, called the model resolutions. Uh, the atmospheric uh, the processes can be divided into two classes based on the scales. For the dynamic processes, are those persons that can be resolved by current model resolution. Those including, like I said, the large scale uh, advective tendency terms, they are handled by the dynamic core in the model, uh, which will be described shortly by Paul. And uh, model physics are uh, considered those cannot be resolved by current model uh, resolution. They include the processes related to aerosol, cloud, convection, radiation, turbulence, and so on. They are handled by the so-called physical parameterizations in the model that I'm going to describe uh, more details uh, in a later talk. Uh, for E3SM, uh, we use the spectral dynamic core. Uh, the model can run like, uh, for the low rest, E3SM is usually run 100 kilometers in horizontal and uh, 80 layers in the vertical with the model top of 60 kilometers. Uh, we can also run like the regional refined match. Uh, that means you can run much higher resolution over the region of interest. Uh, we currently have the regional refined match over uh, North America and the tropical Western Pacific. Uh, Chi Tang will give uh, more detail about this on Thursday. Uh, you also can run the model in a single column model mode. Uh, that actually allow you to connect uh, your model development with detailed field measurements, such as from the DOE atmospheric radiation measurement program. So uh, uh, Xue Zheng will uh, provide more information on this on Thursday. Uh, the model also includes uh, very advanced atmospheric physics I'm going to discuss later. Mm -hmm. So here is a brief uh, history about the evolution of uh, the atmospheric model development. Uh, this is really a big uh, effort made by DOE uh, ESRSM project. Uh, it is the 10 years dedicated effort by a big team consisting of 30 to 50 DOE scientists and a lot of our university collaborators. So uh, we started with the CAM 5.3 uh, in 2014, in June 2014. Since then, we have uh, the model has gone uh, significant independent developments. Uh, right now, we use uh, like the spectral element decor as the default. We increase the model vertical resolutions from the 30 layers to 72 layers in our V1 and V2 model uh, with the uh, 
uh, increase the model top to 60 kilometer. And the vertical resolution is further increased to 80 layers in order to get uh, a good simulation of QBO. Uh, I think Walter Hanna will give a talk on this on Friday. Uh, we also made a significant uh, improvement in atmospheric model physics. This is spe uh, specifically made by uh, the DOE Israel next generation model development of atmospheric physics. We call the NGD uh, atmospheric physics project, uh, which started five years ago. So this slide gave you an uh, idea about uh, the timeline for the model development and also uh, what major changes we made in each of the versions we have. Uh, you can see there are two big uh, model development happened in the past 10 years. Uh, we spent five years in developing the first version of uh, EAM. Uh, that includes in, uh, the increase of vertical level, like I said, and also many improvements in the model physics, uh, such as uh, the ISO, we use the ISO module uh, from uh, M3 to M4. Another big change uh, during this phase is using the cloud. This is a high order closure turbulence scheme to unify the trade, uh, the shallow convection turbulence and the cloud and macro physics. Uh, we also made some other changes uh, another big uh, development phase uh, is starting tw tw uh, 2018, uh, five years ago, through the NGD atmospheric uh, physics model development. Uh, that mainly to develop uh, a suitable uh, model physics for V3. So for Israel and V2, actually, like Chris said, there are Man, uh, effort is on the model retuning and improving the model computational performance with some minor update in the physics. So uh, let's first discuss the dynamic core by Paul Rick. Good morning, everybody. Very exciting to see so much uh, enthusiasm for, for E3SM here. Um, so I'm not actually on the Dynamical Core Development team, but Mark Taylor, who leads Dynamical Core Development for E3SM, asked me to uh, give a talk on the DICOR. I have a lot of familiarity with it uh, as I led the Dynamical Core Model Entry Comparison Project in 2016 and was involved before that. Um, I've done a lot of work on dynamical core development, and that's really what got me started in atmospheric science. Um, but shortly after getting my prof professorship at UC Davis, I realized there's no funding in pursuing die core development, so particularly at academic institutions. So if you're really excited about being involved in dynamical core development, just be aware that you're probably going to be pursuing it as a passion project rather than uh, a funded effort. With that being said, I mean, part of the reason that the funding really dried up to a large degree on dynamical core development is because I feel we did too good of a job. So, <laughs> that's not where the errors are primarily in the atmospheric model. And we can be, can be pretty confident in the die core behavior. So this is a little repetitive um, with what Xiao Chang was just talking about, but basically in order to design an atmospheric dynamical core, what you do is you take the whole globe and you chop it up into regions. Um, since we're obviously not able to track every single atom and molecule that's floating around through the atmosphere, instead we want to describe some kind of bulk quantities associated with the atmosphere in a particular region of the atmosphere, or in a particular region of space. And so these subdivisions then allow us to say, we're going to store basically one degree of freedom for every variable of interest in that bulk region. So Chao Chang already talked about kind of what those variables are. We've got horizontal velocities, vertical velocities, energy, moisture content, and many, many other tracers um, or chemical constituents that are basically pushed around um, by the atmospheric wind. So that is the resolved portion of the atmosphere, and that's responsible for a large portion of what's stored to disk. Um, but within every grid cell, of course, we have processes that occur on the subgrid scale. So that is like microphysics, moist processes, cloud condensation, uh, turbulence that cannot be represented kind of at this bulk scale and instead are parameterized or basically represented using empirical or statistical relationships with underlying theory governing basically how those terms are defined in the equations of motion. Um, and so the die core itself is then responsible for handling those bulk 
the bulk regions, basically the resolved regions uh, on the grid. So just in order to see where that kind of fits in in a flow chart, on the top left-hand side here, you have the dynamical core, again, responsible for horizontal transport and resolved scale uh, vertical motion. Uh, and so that incorporates variables such as wind velocity, pressure, temperature, as well as tracer species, which are pushed around um, by the die core. Um, the processes that are represented by the die core then are adiabatic processes. Um, so basically, I basically basic thermodynamic equation stuff um, and uh, transport of momentum, uh, as well as diffusion, basically bulk diffusion, which is used in order to maintain uh, atmospheric model stability. Everything in the bottom right here is basically the physical parameterizations. This is in no way a complete set, um, but just basically used to delineate what exactly is the resolved dynamics and what is the subgrid scale processes. So as mentioned, the dynamical core is responsible for solving the non-hydrostatic fluid equations, which are basically the Navier-Stokes equations um, for those who have studied fluid dynamics. Uh, and here we've written in a slightly different form than what uh, Xiao Chang showed before. Basically, we've got, you don't have to memorize these, there will not be a test after. Um, but basically here, we've got horizontal velocity in two terms here. So U and V are representing, in this case, the eastward and northward components of the velocity. Uh, and that those respond to things like curvature of the surface, pressure gradients, and Coriolis. Uh, we've got vertical velocity, um, which primarily responds to vertical pressure gradients and gravitational acceleration. Uh, we've got geopotential, which is actually tracked in the model, um, which is basically how high your box is located. Uh, and that responds to vertical velocity. Basically, if you've got a fluid parcel sitting there and it's got positive vertical velocity, it's gonna move up. And if it's got negative vertical velocity, it moves down. We've got the continuity equation, which governs mass conservation in the atmosphere. So our atmosphere is nice and fully conservative uh, for NASA at least, and for thermodynamics to handle uh, energy conservation. In addition, we also have the ideal gas law, which is our closure. And so all in all, we have um, these equations in order to basically close the system. And then our goal in the dynamical core is to effectively just solve these equations to the highest accuracy we possibly can. Um, so getting back to this idea of discretization, probably the simplest form of discretization you can think of is a regular latitude longitude discretization of the sphere. So in that case, we just take lines of constant latitude and lines of constant longitude and use those in order to actually subdivide our different regions in space. Um, this unfortunately has an issue when it comes to actually modeling it using the dynamical core. Namely, you got convergence of grid lines near the poles, and it turns out that if you ever do any numerical uh, computational fluid dynamics, you're constrained by a condition known as the Courant Friedrichs Lewy condition or a CFL condition, which basically says the fastest you can run your model is proportional to the smallest grid spacing. So, whenever you have convergence of grid lines in this case, it means that your model becomes much slower than it should if you're trying to run on any type of grid. And if you try to go beyond that, then you end up with instability. Uh, implicit methods were mentioned earlier, but there's other reasons that we choose not to pursue those. But anyway, this regular latitude longitude grid was used for a long time, but eventually we just hit a wall uh, in die core development where we found we cannot push any further uh, while still maintaining computational efficiency. And so we sought out alternatives. So the E3SM atmospheric model actually uses a grid known as the cubed sphere grid, uh, which is kind of a, a neat concept. The basic idea is you take like a cubic balloon, you draw a grid on every face of that cubic balloon, put it inside of a sphere and then inflate it so that it fills the sphere. So you've got basically six panels, each of which has this regular two-dimensional grid located on it. Um, and you get this nice effect like this and you don't have you don't have convergence of grid lines you'll notice all the grid cells are relatively even looking in terms of overall size particularly compared to the regular latitude longitude grid here um, but you do end up with some other issues that need to be solved in the numerical methods such as what do you do with these panel boundaries where you have kinks in the uh, grid lines um, and yeah how do you transfer information basically across the interface and how do you basically solve equations in um, when you don't have like when you have these, this kind of weird curvature. Um, and so this is where things like Riemannian geometry and whatnot come into play, but again, not a topic for you today. 
Um, so zooming in on what exactly this grid looks like, basically, again, this is just a subdivision into quadrilaterals. Um, the E3SM atmospheric model only works on quadrilaterals, so that's the only thing you have to worry about. Um, those quadrilaterals can be arranged in basically any way you imagine, but they do have to be quadrilaterals. So there's no triangle, no pentagons, no hexagons in the atmospheric model. Um, just quadrilaterals. Uh, these regions are known as elements or faces, depending on how you define it. And you've probably also heard terms like either grid or mesh. Those are basically interchangeable when it comes to describing how to discretize the sphere. The method used by the atmospheric model is the spectral element method. Um, again, I'm not going to go into details on how exactly this method works, but what you need to know is that Every element that I just showed, every quadrilateral that I just showed is basically subdivided into a bunch of points. And at every one of those points, we store one bit of information for every variable that we're, we're modeling. You'll notice the points are not evenly spaced. And in fact, for the spectral element method, they tend to be clustered more closely towards the element boundaries. These are points known as the gauss lobato legendre points uh, and are typically used in things like uh, discrete integration over the sphere. Uh, this method is chosen because it allows for high accuracy, and so even in regions where you have changes in mesh resolution, we don't lose significant accuracy, and as a consequence, we don't have significant artifacts when you have transitions in those grid resolution in, in that grid resolution. Um, so, by default, e E3SM uses fourth order GLL nodes, which basically means four nodes. Uh, along each edge. And this is referred to as the NP4 grid. So if you ever hear, uh, if you ever see a data output from E3SM that's labeled NP4, it means that it's on this grid. For the most part, you don't have to worry about that because of what I'll talk about later. But if you're debugging, for instance, the dy dynamical core, then you'll want to know what the NP4 grid is. Paul, quick yeah. question. So does that mean each of those nodes are calculated with the equations before, but the outputs are stored for each element? No. Uh, the for the NP4 outputs, they're all stored on the nodes as well. So it's calculated and stored at those individual nodes. You'll notice that that means that every element then has, well, in this case, 16 uh, data points associated with it. So it's not what I said before, one variable equals one element. Elements are kind of like compound information. So 16 bits of, for every, 16 degrees of freedom for every variable in every element. Okay. Um, when you actually take all of those elements then and put them onto the sphere, this is what you get. And in fact, you'll notice that all those points along the edges are actually shared with neighboring elements. Um, and so this does not correspond then to two different uh, degrees of freedom or two different values for that particular location. We remove all of those redundancies whenever you have overlap. Um, if you're ever staring at an NP4 grid like this, you'll have a tendency in order to kind of group them together in these three by three chunks. Um, but you'll notice that's not actually how things work in terms of the data output. Instead, it's actually in these four by four chunks, which take bits of each of the three by three chunks. Um, so these nodes are referred to as interior nodes or edge nodes or corner nodes, depending on where they're located. As mentioned, the spectral element method is very flexible and very robust. Um, we can take these quadrilaterals and deform them in essentially any way we like, as long as they're not uh, degenerate, which basically means no hourglass shaped quadrilaterals. Um, and in that case, you can always find the location for these nodes uh, using basically just simple geometric de deformation formulas. And as a consequence, we can basically build any grid then out of quadrilaterals and use the spectral element method in order to solve those equations of motion on that grid. Um, so then you get grids which look like this, where you have basically a coarse resolution quadrilateral grid over on the left-hand side that through um, basically some very particular choices of how exactly we lay out those quadrilaterals transitions very cleanly to higher resolution over on the right-hand side. All right. Everything here is a quadrilateral, but we still move from coarse quadrilaterals to fine quadrilaterals on the right. Okay. And then you can extend this further to basically define grids wherever you like. 
Uh, and so this is an example of regionally refined mesh. This is not the NARRM that was talked about earlier. This is uh, a grid that we use in the Hyperfastest project in order to do simulations of extreme weather over the contiguous US, where we wanted to put higher resolution over the contiguous US and higher resolution in the trop tropical cyclogenesis region in the Atlantic. So you notice that little tail of high resolution that extends out there so that we better capture tropical cycles. And so you can make decisions like this. You can say, I want to have a little bit of refinement over the Himalayas. I want to have some refinement over the Andes and basically place your refinement wherever you like um, in E3SM. Um, as mentioned, because we use this high order method, uh, this very accurate spectral element method, the transition regions can be very sharp without producing significant artifacts. Uh, and so it's very difficult, even if you have a tropical cyclone passing through that interface, to notice any obvious imprinting uh, on the grid. Okay, so that's the NP4 grid. As mentioned, you don't have to worry about that too much, but I think it's important to kind of know what the difference is between NP4 and PG2. So the PG2 grid, which is what most of the output is, the, or what is the format of most of the output from E3SM, this is much simpler. Here we take every element and we chop it up into a two by two block. This is known as a PG2 grid and we store within each of those uh, subfaces, basically the value of the average field within that subface, okay? So you don't have to worry about gauss lobato legendre nodes, where they're located or anything like that. Here, it's just nice, even spacing. Again, elements chopped up into two by two sections. Uh, if you have ever run CESM, it uses something similar, but I believe they also use a PG3 grid where you chop it up into three by three instead of two by two. Um, Whenever we run the physical parameterizations, it's always run on this PG2 grid. And this is also where the output is written from this PG2 grid. Okay, so there's a lot of remapping of data, basically transfer of data between that NP4 grid that I showed earlier and the PG2 grid um, in order to basically compute th things like the parameterizations and the output. So if I was just to overlay the two on top of one another, this is basically where you would find those NP4 points within the PG2 grid. Okay, everybody clear? NP4 versus PG2? All right, good. In terms of the overall vertical coordinate, um, now that we've mastered the horizontal coordinate, the vertical coordinate is a terrain following coordinate, which basically means when you talk about model levels, the largest model level is located at the bottom of the model here. That is the largest value of pressure, and it follows along with the underlying topography. This means that those model levels at the bottom are very rough. Uh, as you go higher and higher up in the model, it transitions towards something which is much more smooth in order to reflect basically the typical flows that you would see in an atmosphere. Um, namely, as you go higher up, things tend to be more horizontal um, and more basically along these coordinate surfaces. And it basically solves a lot of issues associated with uh, topographic artifacts showing up when trying to solve those equations of motion higher up in the atmosphere. Um, so whenever you output data on model levels, this is kind of the levels that are going to pop out and you're going to have to do post-processing if you want to extract things like uh, data on different pressure levels if you're dealing with the model level data or rely on E3SM's internal ability to regrid to pressure levels in order to do that output. The only time I can think of you wanting to use model levels is if you're interested in doing things like uh, hub height wind speeds or something like that, where you need to basically follow along with the topography, where you need to know something like 80 meters above the underlying surface. Okay. Uh, because E3SM uses an unstructured grid, that means that there's no natural way by which we can label all the points in the grid with like two dimensional indices. So on the latitude longitude grid, you give it a longitude index and a latitude index, and that gives you a two dimensional point in space. In E3SM, we only have one index, which in the data file is known as n call. n call basically is number of columns. And so when the, with the horizontal decomposition like this, that n call just goes from zero to number of degrees of freedom, number of PG2 bases minus one, basically, in your data file. Uh, and in terms of the overall ordering, basically within every element, because of the PG2 grid, those indices are all adjacent to one another, but there should be no expectation that you mentally can map from a given 1D index to a particular location on the sphere. It could be anywhere, particularly if you're using like a regionally refined mesh or something of the sort. Okay. So that's where we rely on post-processing tools in order to basically allow us to visualize and regrid that data to something which is um, more intuitive. 
So if you actually dump a E3SM NetCDF output file, what you will typically see then is, for instance, an n call dimension here, which is the number of horizontal faces, in this case, the number of like PG2 faces that are in the grid. Um, you'll have a, often have a latitude and longitude variable, which specifies the latitude and longitude of where exactly the center of that face is on the sphere. And you'll have a set of um, physical variables which then describe the data which is located at each of those positions. And so again, you'll notice that there's only one dimension here in space um, as part of those indices. So again, you have to use a post-processing tool to be able to visualize or uh, regrid that or do any analysis with it. Um, all right, and I think in summary then, um, the atmospheric model dynamical cores are used to solve the equations governing fluid motion. E3SM makes use of the spectral element dynamic core. Um, this has also been recently adopted by CESM um, because of it's, it's very accurate and uses these arbitrary quadrilateral grids, so enables regional refinement. This is a big push in CESM in particular. Uh, physics is computed on the physics grid or the PG grid, uh, which is a quasi-uniform subdivision of elements. And again, you don't really have to worry that much about the NP grid, except to know that's what the dynamics uses. And by default, output from E3SM is also on the physics grid. Um, the usage of this unstructured grid means that the data is indexed in your files in 1D. So that's kind of the big take home message I want from this kind of long winded talk about how the dynamical core operates. Uh, and this can be hard to visualize without the right tools. And so we have tools like NCVIS uh, and UX array, which then work with this unstructured data. Yes. Can you go back one slide? Yes. So if this is a PG2 uh, thing, wouldn't end call then be like always a number that's divisible by four or something because it's going to one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yes. And this number's uh, not divisible by four. Yeah. Uh, I, I was planning on awarding a prize for anybody who actually noticed that. So come talk to me afterwards. This is actually, <laughs> this is actually NP4 output, which I have claimed is PG2 output. <laughs> But you'll be dealing primarily with PG2 output. And in that case, yes, the numbers will always be divisible by four. So good eye. <laughs> yes. The uh, mesh refinement is, are those tools also available? Yes. So the tool that we usually use for mesh refinement is SquadGen, um, which basically takes a PNG file where you can specify some regions as black, some regions as white, wherever it's. Uh, white is, will be refined and wherever it's black, it's not. And so it's like a, a latitude, longitude type cylindrical projection you can pass in. Uh, if you don't want to do that, there's also command line arguments for things like, I just want to refine between these two latitude, longitude locations and refine this many times. So it's, it's pretty cool. Draw the PNG. And... Yep. I can show you some examples later. Cool. Yes. In terms of the mapping, does it happen only in the physics call or? How frequently it happens between the MP4 to PG2 transition? Um, it so it occurs whenever you call the physics parameterizations uh, to remap the MP4 data to the PG grid in order to calculate the physics. Um, I glossed over this, but actually we don't re remap the state variables back to the MP4 grid because then we would lose information. Um, instead, what we do is remap the tendencies, which is basically the DDT term, the back to the uh, MP4 grid and then apply that on the MP4 grid. Is there a significant, significant computational complexity for this operation? Or is it... um, sorry, computational complexity or computational cost? I think it, well, it, the, the decision was actually because it made things cheaper. Um, so instead of having to call physics on the MP4 grid, which had more degrees of freedom uh, and had issues because of the non-uniformity of its locations, basically you ended up with vertical velocities that were higher when you had closer grid spacing. Um, the PG2 grid solved that issue with uh, basically the grid imprinting. And because you only have four physics calls within every element, it reduced the cost by about a half. Yes. Here the latitude and longitude will be the grid mean of each of the PG2 with all the output at that point average with the boundaries or how will, will the output be? Um, I mean, as a DICOR developer, we kind of play fast and loose when it comes to where exactly the data is located. Um, the latitude and longitude are roughly corresponding to the center point of that particular PG2 face. Um, 
as to the actual what it actually stores, it is numerically effectively an average over the PG2 pace, but to second order accuracy, that's also an approximation to the value directly at the center point of that face. So yeah, again, unless you're really interested in very high precision numerics, um, you can just assume that it means the center point of the PG2 face. Yes. Uh, I probably should ask this question later uh, tomorrow, but we don't have a, a section for couplers. So uh, at least uh, I just, uh, from the code base, part of the code use uh, MPAS, and MPAS is based on uh, a different grid, I guess, uh, Voronoi or- yeah, a Voronoi yeah. tessellation. So uh, can you just briefly uh, briefly talk about uh, how, uh, like, how can you deal with like different grid transformations? It's specifically in the coupler or for post-processing? Uh, in the coupler, yeah. Um, so in the coupler, they, uh, there's a couple of different remapping options depending on what the properties are that are needed. So there's monotone remapping whenever you need to not have tra negative tracer densities, for instance. Um, and there's high order remapping when you want to have higher order accuracy and don't care about producing uh, negativity. But the um, most of those maps are generated by Tempest Remap then, uh, and basically it just takes in two meshes and finds kind of the best mapping between your input mesh and your, your output mesh. And so there the remapping is done from the NP4 grid to the MPAS grid and vice versa. All right. Okay, thank you, Paul. So in next uh, few slides, I'm going to provide more details about uh, how those important physical processes uh, parameterized in ESRSM. So this image shows uh, those important physical processes that need to be represented in an uh, atmospheric model, uh, those including the radiation and uh, chemical processes, aerosol and the cloud processes, convection, boundary layer processes, surface flux, gravity waves, and the interactions across all those physical processes. Uh, those processes, like I mentioned earlier, occurred at a scale smaller than uh, model resolution. Then it, they cannot be explicitly calculated. They are represented in atmospheric model through parameterizations. Uh, here is a rough definition about the parameterization. Uh, it is a representation of effect of subgrade scale processes in terms of resolved scale field based on physical laws and the statistical relations found from the observation, uh, similar like Paul just mentioned. So uh, this slide uh, gave you an idea how those important physical processes are currently represented in the most recent version of ESRSM uh, V3. Uh, this including the deep convection that is uh, represented by the John McFarland scheme that was developed uh, uh, in 1995. Uh, this scheme has been used in CAM and also some other climate models, uh, but we have made a lot of enhancement uh, in terms of the convective triggering and the closure and the mesoscale heating and the convective cloud microphysics uh, that I'm going to describe a little bit more in the next slides. And for the shallow convection turbulence and the cloud microphysics, we use uh, the club. This is the cloud layers unified by uh, binomials. Uh, actually, this scheme was developed by Chris Gala, who is sitting there. Uh, uh, almost 20 uh, years ago, uh, this scheme can, you know, uh, unify the trade, all those uh, three processes together to remove the artificial uh, transition from one process to another one. And for the gravity wave, uh, we use the scheme described by Richter and in 2010. Uh, this has been now changed. Uh, it's also used in the CAM model. And for the uh, stratiform cloud, we use the predicted particle properties, the so-called P3 scheme. Uh, we also uh, input uh, uh, many physical uh, aerosol physics 
Right now, we are using the MAM5. This is a new module, aerosol module. Uh, M5 with many enhancement to aerosol physics. Uh, for the atmospheric chemistry, uh, in our V1, V2 model, uh, we don't have interactive uh, chemistry in troposphere. So right now, we are using uh, the so-called uh, CAM UCI, this is the chemistry scheme developed by the University uh, of California Irvine's group. And uh, this is uh, used for uh, troposphere and for stratosphere, we use the linearized ozone scheme. And for the radiation, uh, we have not changed. Uh, this has been the rapid radiation transfer for, uh, model that had been used uh, in long time in CAM model and also in Israel SM uh, and the many other models. So I'm going to give a little bit more detail about those uh, individual schemes. Uh, this slide gave you the idea about the original uh, John McFarren scheme. Uh, it is a simplified uh, Alcava Schubert 1974 scheme. Uh, it used a bulk updraft and downdraft intended to represent an ensemble of updraft and downdraft. Uh, it is the trigger and the closure are uh, cape based. Cape uh, is the convective available potential energy, like I showed here. Uh, the convection in the model is triggered in the original John McFarland scheme is when K is larger than uh, a threshold they side. Uh, that means the model has uh, detects uh, convective instability, then convection will occur. And uh, the cloud mass flux is determined by closure uh, designed to reduce the instability at a prescribed time scale. So this is the original uh, John McFarland scheme. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, since then we have made a lot of changes. Uh, in addition to the dilute cape, uh, this is what this was introduced to CAM five uh, by Neo at all twenty o eight. They introduced the instrument dilute in the calculation of cape in order to couple the tropical humidity with convection. Uh, after that, uh, for Israel SM, we have made a lot of uh, changes, uh, specifically in order to improve its triggering function, uh, the cloud mass flux, this is uh, also relevant to the closure. Uh, we also add the uh, mesoscale heating on top of the uh, John McFarland deep convective heating. Uh, we also use uh, more sophisticated cloud microphysics for convective cloud. So let's first look at the new convective trigger that uh, was already used in V2 model. Uh, this trigger is used to address two common model errors in convection. One is uh, the convection occur too frequent and too weak overlap. This is very common problem for most of the climate models. And also most of the CMAP model also fail to capture the elevated and corner precipitation. So uh, for the uh, D cape is the so-called dynamic cape. This is defined as a cape uh, at a hypothetic atmosphere minus the cape at current state. The hypothetic uh, atmosphere, the T, uh, is really the temperature plus the contributions to the advective tendency. And the moisture is also uh, the moisture, the current state uh, added by the, uh, the contribution from the, the large scale advections. So in this uh, new trigger, we not only require the K larger than zero, we also uh, need the large scale dynamics also inferable for convection. So the so-called DK larger than zero. Uh, this add an additional large scale constraint to prevent K from released simultaneously when uh, it is generated. It's required, you know, the large scale environment also uh, favorable to convection uh, onset. We also implement uh, the so-called unrestricted air, so, uh, air parcel launch level, we call the ULL method. 
uh, this really to help to capture the convection above the boundary layer at night. You know, usually at night, the boundary layer is very stable uh, if you only use CAPE. Uh, yes, uh, if the CAPE calculated starting from uh, uh, the initial uh, lifting level is within the boundary, usually the CAPE will be negative. Is the convection won't be uh, occurred. So we remove that restriction uh, by using that, actually, we can capture the convection above the boundary, the so-called middle-level convections. Um, the new trigger really helps to improve the simulation of dyno cycle precipitation and also precipitation intensity distributions. So another feature we introduce is we change the calculation of cloud mass flux. Uh, this is the original scheme. This is based on the Cape. Uh, closure. Uh, what we did, we add an uh, additional uh, term uh, for the uh, 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 cloud mass flux uh, determined by the cape closure. This is the vertical velocity at top of the boundary layer. So by adding that term, you can see uh, if there is uh, upward motion uh, at the boundary layer top, the uh, cloud mass flux will be enhanced. And if there is a downward motion in the free troposphere, the revised cloud mass flux will be becoming weaker. So in this way, uh, we actually see a lot of good features, uh, specifically uh, that lead to an improvement of tropical waves such as MGO and the carbon wave, and also di the dino cycle precipitation. So we also add the so-called multi-scale coherence structures parameterization. This is the mesoscale parameterization for mesoscale effort on effect on convection. So basically what we did is we add the mesoscale warming uh, added in the stratiform region and uh, evaporative, uh, evaporative cooling is added beneath. This is consistent with the observations. Uh, for the metal scale, uh, like heating and the cooling uh, is uh, effect. So this also helped to uh, improve the simulation of tropical waves like MGO and the current wave. Uh, I, uh, I will show later, you can see a lot of our improvement actually uh, lead to the improved simulation of tropical variabilities. So like I mentioned, we also uh, add uh, a two moment uh, cloud microphysics scheme for convective cloud. Uh, this also lead to the improvement of tropical variabilities. Uh, for the stratiform cloud, we use the P3 scheme. This is the predicted uh, particle um, properties scheme uh, to improve the particular the ice cloud. So uh, in P3, the ice particles are predicted and involved locally, removing the artificial uh, conversion of particles, uh, they also consider the room, the particles. Uh, after implement this scheme, we see uh, also some uh, very nice improvement. Uh, I just use this figure to show uh, the improvement in uh, the long wave cloud forcing. You can see uh, the MG2 is uh, currently used in V2 model. You can see over the polar region, uh, uh, the model bears, this is the model bears. You can see the model bears are, are largely reduced. And using this scheme also help to reduce the uh, aerosol forcing. That is a major problem for us to unable to capture the long-term surface temperature trend like Chris described. Isn't the RMSC larger? What? The RMSC is larger. Uh, that's good idea. Yeah, it's a uh, little bit larger, but, but uh, I will show later actually for the mean state uh, is very comparable to V3, but the major improvement in the tropical variability and dyno cycle. So, uh, but this does show some nice feature for the polar region. Those uh, bars are almost entirely removed. Yeah, so uh, I mentioned for the turbulence shallow convection, the cloud microphysics, we use the CLAB uh, scheme to uh, unif 
form uh, represent all those three uh, processes. So this has led to better transition from shallow to deep convection, and also better transition from strider cumulus to cumulus cloud, and also better simulation of strider cumulus. For the ISO, we have made a lot of uh, improvement, particularly in the past five years. Uh, right now, we are using uh, a newly developed five mode version of the model uh, ISO module. MM5 by adding the one additional mode in the stratosphere course more uh, for prognostic treatment of stratospheric sulfate aerosols uh, from explosive volcano eruptions. So in addition to that, we also made a lot of other changes in aerosol physics. So such as we have a mosaic aerosol chemistry module for nitrate aerosols. So that uh, provides a new capability for simulating uh, nitrate aerosol and is really forcing in ESRSM, uh, which has not been existed in many CMAP6 models. But I think that has largely increased the computational cost. Uh, it's increased almost uh, about 40%. So unfortunately, this uh, scheme is not in the default mode, but uh, is as a research mode, you can use that for your research purpose. Uh, we also improve the representation of secondary organic aerosol and many other improvements, including improve the aerosol white removal to reduce the aerosol forcing and also retain the aerosol properties, also targeting to reduce the aerosol forcing because this is one of the major goals for our recent model development. Uh, is really try to reduce Israel's and aerosol forcing in order to allow us to re, uh, capture the observed surface temperature warming trend. So in addition to that, we also improve the numerical coupling of aerosol processes. Uh, and uh, we implement a new dust emission. So for the atmospheric chemistry, uh, like I mentioned, uh, right now we are using uh, interactive gas chemistry developed by the uh, UC Irvine's chemical, uh, chemical, uh, chemistry group. Uh, this is for uh, troposphere, this including 28 advective tracers. And uh, for the stratosphere, we use the linear ozone the, uh, version three uh, to account those chemical species, uh, the effect on the radiation. So this really enable uh, ISRSM to project future greenhouse gas and uh, also enable the coupling of aerosol chemistry and the biogeochemistries. This largely enhance the uh, ISRSM's uh, capability in coupling different or system components. For the radiation, uh, we still use the uh, rapid radiative transfer model. Uh, for uh, uh, all the radiative flux and the heating uh, and the cooling rate are calculated over 14 band in the short wave and the 16 band in the long wave. Uh, the gravity wave, we consider, uh, consider the three types of gravity waves. Uh, one is uh, caused by the orography, and another one caused by convection, and also the third uh, uh, type is caused by the frontal systems. So uh, this scheme has not been changed. It's also used in the NCAR model. So in a brief summary, uh, for the cloud and the convection, we have spent a huge amount of effort in improving uh, the cloud scheme and also the uh, John McFarland deep convection scheme. Uh, uh, as I'm going to show later, this has relatively minor impact on the mean climate, but largely improved the tropical variability, dino cycle and the aerosol forcing. Uh, for the Chemistry and aerosol, right now we have uh, interactive chemistry uh, that coupled with uh, much enhanced aerosol physics that allow the ISRSM 
uh, to predict the important trace gases and the chemical uh, chemistry aerosol coupling and also better simulate the aerosol forcing. <clears throat> So in addition to that, we also made some other changes at the last stage of V3 uh, model development. Uh, one uh, notable change is the vertical resolution. We increase from 72 layers to 80 layers in order to capture the, uh, the QBO. Uh, as I showed in this figure, uh, you can see the right panel shows uh, the red line actually is from the uh, uh, old model uh, using the 72 layers. Uh, the magnitude of QPO is very compared to, compared to the ERA5 analysis. The blue line shows uh, both the coupled and uncoupled run with uh, new vertical grids. You can see it's actually comparable to uh, the ERA5 reanalysis. Uh, Walter Hanna uh, will give more on this on Friday. Uh, we also uh, revised the surface gasiness formulation and uh, made some other changes in topography and uh, add uh, online diagnostic tool that allow you for uh, to facilitate first level model evaluations and debugging. Okay, I'm going to use the following uh, few slides to highlight some of the performance uh, using this new atmospheric model. Uh, the first uh, is um, to show the, uh, the mean state. This is a summary, uh, summary slide for several important climate fields, including the TOE night radiative flux, the short wave forcing, long wave forcing, and the precipitation, uh, the surface temperature over land, and uh, sea level pressure, and uh, some dynamic field. Uh, this is the uh, root mean square of different versions of ESRSM, V1, V2, and V3, compared with the CMAP SIG, AMAP ensembles. So the sample on this slide uh, representing uh, the comparison between V2 and the V3 plus means V3 performs better than V2 uh, tilt is they have similar performance then cross means uh, V3 is worse than V2. You can see from this V3 has uh, largely improved the simulation of long wave cloud forcing, the surface precipitation and also surface temperature over land but it's degraded uh, the short wave forcing, the uh, total night cloud, uh, the radiative fluxes, and also the uh, 500, uh, the geopenetral height at 500 millibar. So, uh, but overall, uh, the results are comparable uh, as showed by Chris. Actually, our V2 model is a very good model compared to other CMAP models. So, uh, we are very happy uh, the V3 model has not uh, largely degraded the performance uh, compared to V2. Uh, but we dramatically improved the tropical variabilities. Uh, this improvement are very robust across different development, uh, development version and in both coupled and uh, uncoupled simulations. So let's first look at the dyno cycle. Uh, this is a dyno cycle over corners during the summertime. Uh, as you can see from the trim data, uh, the dyno cycle uh, this, over this region is featured as the uh, convection initiated along the Rocky Mountains, then propagate uh, into the central uh, US at night. Uh, our V2 model is reasonable while to capture this uh, dyno uh, phase change, uh, but the peak is uh, precipitation peak few hours later than what observed uh, in trim uh, over the central US. And it also shows the difficulties to capture the late afternoon peak uh, over along the uh, east coast and also southeast coast. So those problems have been largely uh, addressed in the new version, the EAM V3. Uh, if you look at the magnitude, actually the color scale 
uh, the color situation representing the amplitude of dyno cycle. So they use different color scales. Uh, if you raise the, the number here, you can see actually not only we improve the uh, dyno phase, but we also largely improve the amplitude of the dyno cycle uh, in V3 model compared to V2. <coughs> We also see this improvement over the tropics. The entire tropics, this is the uh, trim data V2 and the V3. Uh, if you look at the color, you can immediately see the improvement uh, from V2 to V3. Uh, for the tropical waves, uh, this one is from the IMERS data. This is the presentation, uh, this is the current wave. Uh, here is the V2 model. Uh, the, both the current wave and uh, MGO are very weak compared to the observations. Uh, but you can see uh, we dramatically improve the, the magnitude of current wave and also the MGO in different versions of development version. So uh, we see those improvements is very robust across all those uh, different development version. Uh, is uh, in, uh, uh, is uh, not that sensitive to any of the uh, model tuning. So those features are always there. So we believe the improvement is really from the improvement in the model physics. It's not sensitive to model tuning or other some other minor changes. Uh, another big thing uh, is uh, we are able to recapture the observed global surface temperature trend I showed in Chris uh, the talk, and the Susanna Forrest also will be talking about this, the reason why uh, we get there, uh, her talk on Friday. So I won't go any more detail, but this is mainly due to the improvement of the reduction of aerosol forcing in the V3 atmospheric model. Okay, in summary, uh, the ESRSI model uh, is a state of art, the atmospheric component of ESRSI uh, is use the uh, spectral element decor. Uh, the model resolution is 100 kilometer, 80 layers, and uh, with the model top is 60 kilometer. And uh, they are capable to run both region refined mesh and also single column model uh, with uh, much improved uh, atmospheric physics. Uh, for the V3, we uh, introduced total 13 new features. Uh, this is really uh, a, a lot and a big effort. Uh, in order to improve the representation of atmospheric chemistry, aerosol, dust, and cloud microphysics, and the convection. Uh, this has dramatically improved or enhanced the model capabilities for coupling across different systems, and also largely improved the tropical waves, and dyno cycle and the QBO, but produce a comparable result in mean state uh, to V2 model. Uh, we also is able to recapture the observed the surface temperature trend. This uh, actually the single big goal for our V3 model development. We achieve this goal uh, by improving the atmospheric physics. For the future, uh, uh, specifically for the low rise uh, ESRSM V4 model, uh, like mentioned in Chris talk and Dave's talk, uh, this will based on the C++ uh, version of uh, Emacs X. Um, so, but we need to add some needed physics in order for uh, Emacs X uh, to run for the low resolution applications, uh, such as we need to turn on the deep convection when you are running the low resolution, uh, you also need the parameterization of gravity waves and uh, prognostic uh, aerosol and the chemistry. There are a lot of work on this. Uh, we are also exploring the machine learning method uh, in order to utilize the data created from the ESRSM global cloud resolving model, the screen, uh, to uh, emulate you know, the ESRSM low-rise physics. Yeah, uh, that's all uh, from my talk. Yeah.
Any questions? Yeah. Um, how to, so like practically, I can understand the introduction of the DK area, but, but physically, how the cape can feel the, the cape can, the, the convection, like itself can only, itself can only feel the, the cape. How can it feel the DK? Like how, how the physically DK can affect the field? Yeah, the decay is the difference between the cape calculated at the current state. So you have a yeah. temperature moisture. Then between the current cape and the uh, hypothetical cape, that is determined by the temperature and the moisture profile uh, with the contributions from the large scale advective tendency. No, I don't. I mean so so uh, then that actually the difference is from the dynamic contributions to the cave generation rate. Then you can use that consider like a dynamic contribution to the cave generation. When the dynamic make a positive contribution to the existing cave, then you allow convection to the trigger. So uh, maybe I have a different way. So when the cave is positive, but the cave is negative, yeah, but there will be no no convection. That means the large scale environment is not favorable for convection. So what's the like? Uh, so usually we, we just but just think about cape like cape is positive, mm -hmm. then we think have convection, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so how how now how we argue between the different? Yeah, different usually the cape uh, will be accumulated over a time, so it's. Cannot in the real atmosphere, the cape won't be released immediately when it's generated. It will hold until you have a variable large scale condition, then the cape will be released and consumed by the convection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like there are, you know, a couple of physical parameterization that can generate precipitation by mm -hmm. deep, deep convection. Uh, club and P3 and then perhaps also multi-scale coherent structure parameterization, right? Mm -hmm. So do we expect to have a precipitation output from each of these parameter, you know, options mm -hmm. that we choose? And mm -hmm. uh, for fi final analyze, you know, we sum up all of them come together? Yeah, the model has a uh, option. You can output uh, precipitation from each of the processes. Okay. Uh, right. They right. basically have the variable name, you know, then you just define in your outfield. Okay. Uh, so a uh, related question is that, so we know that deep convection we're supposed to on for large, you know, uh, uh, simulating large yard areas. Uh, but for other ones, do we, like, do we, are we supposed to turn all of them on or we can choose depending on our you know, question or focus or, yeah. How do we choose? Uh, it depends on the model scale, right? Uh, if you are running like a hundred kilometer mm -hmm. resolution, uh, all those processes need to be turned on. Oh. But if you are running the scale is much finer, you feel some of the uh, physical process could be resolved by the model resolution, you probably can turn it off, like, you know, the if you are running like a screen, uh, the three kilometer resolution, you turn the deep convection on, uh, off. But when you do the research, uh, you probably want to uh, uh, see the impact of individual schemes. Uh, you can artificially turn off any of the scheme, like you, you can turn off deep convection, even it's running at 25 kilometer resolution, you'll see what happened, but you probably uh, really uh, is for your understanding of those physical processes now uh, the right way. Okay. Uh, I have a follow-up question uh, about the uh, uh, cloud and precipitation uh, formation process. So you mentioned that uh, the uh, cloud uh, microphysics is double moment uh, in uh, hot water. I just wonder um, how do we consider uh, those, for example, aerosol number concentrations, uh, from especially when we consider uh, projection under certain scenarios, how can we get this information? For the model. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, probably just depending on the emission file uh, you will need as uh, when you run those couple simulation, you need to prepare those emission file for different scenarios. I, I think uh, probably Chris can know better about this. Uh, so specifically for projection, you definitely need to provide those emission files. So by the way, we do consider like the temporal vari variation mm -hmm. in the aerosol model, right? Yeah. yeah. I wonder, will there be a major retuning for V3, considering that there are many features added? Yeah, yeah, actually, that's a very good question. And uh, when we put all the features together, uh, we also found some coupling issues uh, between different processes we need to address those uh, coupling issues from one process to another that requires some either model retuning or some you know, modifications in the model, such as when we add the, uh, the convective cloud microphysics, we found the RSO 14 actually uh, increased, uh, become stronger. That definitely not something we want to see. Then we retune the RSO chemistry, those coupling. Uh, we need to retune those. Uh, but luckily, actually, for the V3 model development, uh, uh, when we put all things together, it works pretty well. Uh, the model tuning is quite minor, I think, relatively minor. I'm one of the only uh, organizers who actually work here. Uh, and I, um, I, but I'm actually in the Earth Sciences area, which is in a building over the river and through the woods. It's really far from here, but, I'm, but I split my time with, with NERSC. So um, that's my connection here to NERSC. And I've been on E3SM. I'm not a climate scientist, but I've been on E3SM project for many years now. And I'm just gonna talk about NERSC and, and E3SM on, on NERSC. Um, is it a good time to start? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so this, we're, we're Sometimes people just call this the nurse building, but it, it, there's actually um, all of the people who work for nurse do sit here, but uh, there's 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 many more people. Not that it matters. I'm just saying that uh, it, the machine is below us, the Perlmutter and um, uh, other machines, but there are other people outside of nurse that still sit and work in this building. Um, so it's a, a DOE center. It you know we. Uh, buy these machines and um, anyone can apply. I don't know the, the details, but I'm just saying that you can, you know, you can apply and try to get an allocation. Um, and there's, you know, the, the website, you know, will tell you all the details. Um, but, but nurse kids, you know, it, we're not just, it's not just hardware. It's not just buying, you know, just not, it's not just a machine room with, with cycles. They also provide support, you know, and, you know, get the work with the vendors, um, install the software, test the software, uh, provide the user environment. The, there's consultants that work at NERSC. Um, and yeah, so my, my role is as in the NISAP program, which I'm not even going to talk about right now, um, at, at NERSC. Um, so the current, yeah, so the, and, and there's, there's machines that go in and out. I'm sure if anyone's had a, an account at NERSC, you know that, you know, there's been other machines. Perlmutter is the current one. And there are GPU nodes and CPU nodes. And what that means is that, that you can think of them as two, two different clusters. So they, we just call it Perlmutter. Um, and there's, there's good, good reasons for that. But um, the, yeah, so I, I have another slide about the difference between the GPUs and, and the CPU nodes. Um, and yeah, so what I mean by the only connection to E3SM is that is, as far as NERSC is concerned, they're just trying to help all users of the machine, E3SM being one of them, one of the applications. We happen to be an application that uh, uses a lot of compute hours on the machine, so that's interesting to them. Um, and so, yeah, users are... Um, yeah, once, you, once you have an account and you, you're on a project and you get... Um, uh, you get what's called an allocation. So you get, you know, uh, a number of node hours associated with each, uh, with each project and each user. Um, yeah, so like we, we're in the E3SM 
project and, and Unix group, the people who work um, on E3SM. But in this um, tutorial, we, we made one called Ntrain6. Um, and I'm just pointing that out. It's just another example of, a, uh, of an allocation. Um, that's what we're going to use here. Um, and okay, so there is a uh, there is a NERSC user Slack channel that anyone can join if you're a NERSC user. I don't even know if you have to be a NERSC user. Um, and what's cool about that is there's also some NERSC employees that work, I mean, that, 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 that read the NERSC user Slack so you can um, you can find, uh, and it, it's, it provides a way for users to help other users. That's one of the, one of the things that I, I like about it. And of course, you can just submit tickets to, to NERSC. Um, and I, as a, as now that I'm working with NERSC, I see those tickets come in. So I see what people are asking and I see that uh, sometimes it is about E3SM and I chime in. Um, you can also just contact me. Um, okay, so this is again, still just Perlmutter, not talking about E3SM, I was just gonna have a slide. Um, there's, when you, when you log into Perlmutter, you 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 automatically get landed on a login node. There happens to be forty of them, but it doesn't matter to you. It's just gonna it's gonna throw you on a login node, and you can use that to do uh, a lot of a, a lot of different things. And you're not charged for that time on the, on the login nodes. And they have it has you can find all the stats um, uh, of what of what the login nodes have. But from those login nodes is where you would submit a job, and then when you submit a job you would ask for a GPU node, a GPU, a GPU node job or a CPU only node job. And I have the number of <laughs> nodes listed there. And in E3SM, we call those, we call these, the machines, each machine in that E3SM supports has a name and we call it PMGPU and PMCPU. But that's not necessarily what NERS calls them. Um, and so, yeah, so the CPU only nodes have uh, two AMDs, 512 gigabytes per node, which is a lot. Um, typically, uh, this, is, this is one of the biggest, uh, in terms of uh, memory, one of the biggest nodes we've, we've encountered. And it allows you to do some interesting things, to, to pack more on each node. And, you know, yeah, I, I have to mention the, the GPU nodes as well. They have four NVIDIA A100s and, and an AMD. And the, um, you know, the, the compute power is much larger if you were to, I didn't, don't have a, a bar chart, but basically it's all in the GPUs. That's where the, the, the flops are. Um, okay, so the NERSC uses Slurm. Um, there's a, um, you know, the NERSC website does a, a much better job of this, but I just wanted to touch on the, the different file systems because whenever you get on a new file system, and I actually don't even know, I think I do, I think it's more than half of you already have NERSC accounts, so maybe all of this is not that interesting, but there's there's essentially four file systems, your home space that, that stays around, and then there's Scratch, which is really fast, but can get was, it's not backed up and it can get uh, urged um, after so many months. Um, so you need to, you know, save it. And then a, a system called CFS, Common File System, which which is backed up and it's not it's not deleted. But there's a, there's a quota on on that. But also, there's a quota on all of these. And HSI is, is tape. Um, uh, and then there's Globus endpoints. I uh, if you haven't used Globus, it's a way to, to transfer a large amount of data between between big machines. So that's sometimes not relevant. Sometimes it is. Okay. So now, what is how how is how does E three SM interact with Perlman? Um Okay. So it's one of the support. What, what we we in E three SM we have different. We have access to a lot of machines, but some of them we call them supported machines, and E three S and Perlmutter is one of them. And so we're going to make sure that, like the the we, we have nightly tests that, that run on on the machine. Uh, they do a, a lot of different things. They 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 check out the code. They run an entire simulation, you know, a, a full make make a case and run the case and compare it to 
what it might have done last night. Um, and there's there's lots of things there that are looked at, and 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 it's all reported. You can even look at this the C dash. Um, uh, it's it's open. Um, and so my, my point is, it's it's something, I, and there's a lot of users, and I am the uh, the point of contact for the machine. So you know, I'm it's you know it's something that I strive to. One of my goals is to keep keep Ethereum working on Chrome. Okay. Um, there's when you're running Ethereum, you're going to need a lot of data. Um, so it's not just the source. There's a lot of data files that it's it's almost like part of the source in a way. Um, and if you if you're running on a, a machine that doesn't have that data, it can be a little bit annoying. It still tries to automatically download it for you, but it's just nice to know that it's already there and that there's the location. And um, you, other people have access to that data. Um, um, meaning, you know, if you're a user at NERSC, you can get access to this, this data. Um, the E3SM Unified, which is going to be talked about in another, another talk, um, it's a post processing analysis tool that's installed and maintained. Um, there's, I have another slide about this, about, uh, well, so there's, there's always some confusion about what works on GPUs and what doesn't. So I was just saying that, that Scream and MMF are examples of things that do work on, on the GPUs, but not, not everything. Um, a, a common use case. So people would, uh, normally you would just, you get a login node, you would check out the code. You, I, some people work out of home. I like to work out of CFS space. Um, and you, you check out the code, you build and submit submit a job. And it, the default is to, to, to put your case in uh, on the scratch file system, which is what we recommend. You can change it if you want. Um, and then after after you run the, uh, a longer simulation, you might want to copy that output from scratch to CFS and then and then to tape. Yeah. 